Letters of Oscar Wilde, Volume 4, 1897-1898 to To Ada Leverson, from The Catalogue of the Stetson Collection This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Rob Marland Lot 336 Autograph Letter Signed Four pages, small quarto. Hotel Sandwich, Dieppe. No date. To Mrs. Leverson, signed in full. Dear Sphinx, I was so charmed with seeing you yesterday that I must write a line to tell you how sweet and good it was of you to be of the very first to greet me. I often thought of you in the long black days and nights of my prison life, and to find you just as wonderful and dear as ever was no surprise the beautiful are always beautiful etc end of section to frank harris eighteen ninety seven from oscar wilde his life and confessions by frank harris this librivox recording is in the public domain Sandwich Hotel, Dieppe. My dear Frank, just a line to thank you for your great kindness to me, for the lovely clothes and for the generous check. You have been a real good friend to me, and I shall never forget your kindness. To remember such a debt as mine to you, a debt of kind fellowship, is a pleasure. About our tour. Later on, let us think about it. My friends have been so kind to me here that I am feeling happy already. Yours, Oscar Wilde. If you write to me, please do so under cover to R. B. Ross, who is here with me. In the next letter of his, which I have kept, Oscar is perfectly friendly again. He tells me that he is entirely without money, having received nothing from his trustees for months and asks me for an even five pounds, adding, I drift in ridiculous impecuniosity without a sou. End of section. To Mrs. Bernard Beer, from the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 282 Autograph letter signed. Four pages. Small quarto. Hotel sandwich. Dieppe. No date. To Mrs. Bernard Beer. My dear, good, beautiful friend, I knew you would be always sweet and good to me, for now I need sympathy and know its value. A kind word to me now is as lovely as a flower is, and love can heal all wounds. I feel as if I had been raised from the dead. The sun and the sea seem strange to me. But, dear Bernie, although my life looks ruined to the outer world, to me it is not so. I feel that out of it all, out of the silence, the solitary life, the hunger, the darkness, the pain, the disgrace of these things, it was wrong of me. Worse things might have happened to your old friend, dear, than two years' hard labour. Suffering is a terrible fire. It either purifies or destroys. With love and gratitude, ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To the editor of the Daily Chronicle, 28th of May, 1897. From De Profundis, 1909, 14th Methuen edition. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Case of Warder Martin, Some Cruelties of Prison Life. The Editor of the Daily Chronicle. Sir, I learn with great regret, through the columns of your paper, that the Warder Martin of Reading Prison has been dismissed by the prison commissioners for having given some sweet biscuits to a little hungry child. 
I saw the three children myself on the Monday preceding my release. They had just been convicted, and were standing in a row in the central hall in their prison dress, carrying their sheets under their arms, previous to their being sent to the cells allotted to them. I happened to be passing along one of the galleries on my way to the reception room, where I was to have an interview with a friend. They were quite small children, the youngest, the one to whom the warder gave the biscuits, being a tiny little chap, for whom they had evidently been unable to find clothes small enough to fit. I had, of course, seen many children in prison during the two years during which I was myself confined. Wandsworth Prison, especially, contained always a large number of children. But the little child I saw on the afternoon of Monday the 17th, at Reading, was tinier than any one of them. I need not say how utterly distressed I was to see these children at Reading, for I knew the treatment in store for them. The cruelty that is practised by day and night on children in English prisons is incredible, except to those that have witnessed it and are aware of the brutality of the system. People nowadays do not understand what cruelty is, they regard it as a sort of terrible medieval passion, and connect it with the race of men like Eccelene de Romano and others, to whom the deliberate infliction of pain gave a real madness of pleasure. But men of the stamp of Eccelene are merely abnormal types of perverted individualism. Ordinary cruelty is simply stupidity. It is the entire want of imagination. It is the result in our days of stereotyped systems, of hard and fast rules, and of stupidity. Wherever there is centralization, there is stupidity. What is inhuman in modern life is officialism. Authority is as destructive to those who exercise it as it is to those on whom it is exercised. It is the prison board and the system that carries it out that is the primary source of the cruelty that is exercised on a child in prison. The people who uphold the system have excellent intentions. Those who carry it out are humane in intention also. Responsibility is shifted onto the disciplinary regulations. It is supposed that, because a thing is the rule, it is right. The present treatment of children is terrible, primarily from people not understanding the peculiar psychology of a child's nature. A child can understand a punishment inflicted by an individual, such as a parent or guardian, and bear it with a certain amount of acquiescence. What it cannot understand is a punishment inflicted by society. It cannot realise what society is, with Grown people, it is, of course, the reverse. Those of us who are either in prison, or have been sent there, can understand, and do understand, what that collective force called society means, and whatever we may think of its methods or claims, we can force ourselves to accept it. Punishment inflicted on us by an individual, on the other hand, is a thing that no grown person endures, or is expected to endure. The child, consequently, being taken away from its parents by people whom it has never seen, and of whom it knows nothing, and, finding itself in a lonely and unfamiliar cell, waited on by strange faces, and ordered about and punished by the representatives of a system that it cannot understand, becomes an immediate prey to the first and most prominent emotion produced by modern prison life, the emotion of terror. The terror of a child in prison is quite limitless. I remember once at Reading, as I was going out to exercise, seeing in the dimly lit cell right opposite my own a small boy. Two warders, not unkindly men, were talking to him, with some sternness, apparently, or perhaps giving him some useful advice about his conduct. One was in the cell with him, the other was standing outside. The child's face was like a white wedge of sheer terror. 
there was in his eyes the terror of a hunted animal the next morning i heard him at breakfast time crying and calling to be let out his cry was for his parents from time to time i could hear the deep voice of the warder on duty telling him to keep quiet yet he was not even convicted of whatever little offence he had been charged with he was simply on remand that i knew by his wearing his own clothes which seemed neat enough he was however wearing prison socks and shoes this showed that he was a very poor boy whose own shoes if he had any were in a bad state justices and magistrates an entirely ignorant class as a rule often remand children for a week and then perhaps remit whatever sentence they are entitled to pass they call this not sending a child to prison it is of course a stupid view on their part to a little child whether he is in prison on remand or after conviction is not a subtlety of social position he can comprehend to him the horrible thing is to be there at all in the eyes of humanity it should be a horrible thing for him to be there at all this terror that seizes and dominates the child as it seizes the grown man also is of course intensified beyond power of expression by the solitary cellular system of our prisons every child is confined to itself twenty-three hours out of the twenty-four this is the appalling thing to shut up a child in a dimly lit cell for twenty-three hours out of the twenty-four is an example of the cruelty of stupidity if an individual parent or guardian did this to a child he would be severely punished the society for the prevention of cruelty to children would take the matter up at once there would be on all hands the utmost detestation of whomsoever had been guilty of such cruelty a heavy sentence would undoubtedly follow conviction but our own actual society does worse itself and to the child to be so treated by a strange abstract force of whose claims it has no cognizance is much worse than it would be to receive the same treatment from its father or mother or some one it knew the inhuman treatment of a child is always inhuman by whomsoever it is inflicted but inhuman treatment by society is to the child the more terrible because there is no appeal a parent or guardian can be moved and let out a child from the dark lonely room in which it is confined but a warder cannot most warders are very fond of children but the system prohibits them from rendering the child any assistance should they do so as warder martin did they are dismissed the second thing from which a child suffers in prison is hunger the food that is given to it consists of a piece of usually badly baked prison bread and a tin of water for breakfast at half past seven at twelve o'clock it gets dinner composed of a tin of coarse indian meal stirred about and at half past five it gets a piece of dry bread and a tin of water for its supper this diet in the case of a strong grown man is always productive of illness of some kind chiefly of course diarrhoea with its attendant weakness in fact in a big prison astringent medicines are served out regularly by the warders as a matter of course in the case of a child the child is as a rule incapable of eating the food at all any one who knows anything about children knows how easily a child's digestion is upset by a fit of crying or trouble and mental distress of any kind a child who has been crying all day long and perhaps half the night in a lonely dimly lit cell and is preyed upon by terror simply cannot eat food of this coarse horrible kind in the case of the little child to whom warder martin gave the biscuits the child was crying with hunger on tuesday morning and utterly unable to eat the bread and water served to it for its breakfast martin went out after the breakfasts had been served and bought the few sweet biscuits for the child rather than see it starving 
it was a beautiful action on his part and was so recognised by the child who utterly unconscious of the regulation of the prison board told one of the senior warders how kind this junior warder had been to him the result was of course a report and a dismissal i know martin extremely well and i was under his charge for the last seven weeks of my imprisonment on his appointment at reading he had charge of gallery c in which i was confined so i saw him constantly i was struck by the singular kindness and humanity of the way in which he spoke to me and to the other prisoners kind words are much in prison and a pleasant good morning or good evening will make one as happy as one can be in a prison he was always gentle and considerate i happen to know another case in which he showed great kindness to one of the prisoners and i have no hesitation in mentioning it one of the most horrible things in prison is the badness of the sanitary arrangements no prisoner is allowed under any circumstances to leave his cell after half past five p m if consequently he is suffering from diarrhoea he has to use his cell as a latrine and pass the night in a most fetid and unwholesome atmosphere some days before my release martin was going the rounds at half past seven with one of the senior warders for the purpose of collecting the oakum and tools of the prisoners a man just convicted and suffering from violent diarrhoea in consequence of the food as is always the case asked the senior warder to allow him to empty the slops in his cell on account of the horrible odour of the cell and the possibility of illness again in the night the senior warder refused absolutely it was against the rules the man had to pass the night in this dreadful condition martin however rather than see this wretched man in such a loathsome predicament said he would empty the man's slops himself and did so a warder emptying a prisoner's slops is of course against the rules but martin did this act of kindness to the man out of the simple humanity of his nature and the man was naturally most grateful as regards the children a great deal has been talked and written lately about the contaminating influence of prison on young children what is said is quite true a child is utterly contaminated by prison life but the contaminating influence is not that of the prisoners it is that of the whole prison system of the governor the chaplain the warders the lonely cell the isolation the revolting food the rules of the prison commissioners the mode of discipline as it is termed of the life every care is taken to isolate a child from the sight even of all prisoners over sixteen years of age children sit behind a curtain in chapel and are sent to take exercise in small sunless yards sometimes a stone yard sometimes a yard at the back of the mills rather than that they should see the elder prisoners at exercise but the one really humanising influence in prison is the influence of the prisoners their cheerfulness under terrible circumstances their sympathy for each other their humility their gentleness their pleasant smiles of greeting when they meet each other their complete acquiescence in their punishments are all quite wonderful and i myself learned many sound lessons from them i am not proposing that the children should not sit behind a curtain in chapel or that they should take exercise in a corner of the common yard i am merely pointing out that the bad influence on children is not and could never be that of the prisoners but is and will always remain that of the prison system itself there is not a single man in reading jail that would not gladly have done the three children's punishment for them when i saw them last it was on the tuesday following their conviction i was taking exercise at half past eleven with about twelve other men as the three children passed near us in charge of a warder from the damp dreary stone yard in which they had been at their exercise i saw the greatest pity and sympathy in the eyes of my companions as they looked at them 
prisoners are as a class extremely kind and sympathetic to each other suffering and the community of suffering makes people kind and day after day as i tramped the yard i used to feel with pleasure and comfort what carlyle calls somewhere the silent rhythmic charm of human companionship in this as in all other things philanthropists and people of that kind are astray it is not the prisoners who need reformation it is the prisons of course no child under fourteen years of age should be sent to prison at all it is an absurdity and like many absurdities of absolutely tragic results if however they are to be sent to prison during the daytime they should be in a workshop or schoolroom with a warder at night they should sleep in a dormitory with a night warder to look after them they should be allowed exercise for at least three hours a day the dark badly ventilated ill-smelling prison cells are dreadful for a child dreadful indeed for any one one is always breathing bad air in prison the food given to children should consist of tea and bread and butter and soup prison soup is very good and wholesome a resolution of the house of commons could settle the treatment of children in half an hour i hope you will use your influence to have this done the way the children are treated at present is really an outrage on humanity and common sense it comes from stupidity let me draw attention now to another terrible thing that goes on in english prisons indeed in prisons all over the world where the system of silence and cellular confinement is practised i refer to the large number of men who become insane or weak-minded in prison in convict prisons this is of course quite common but in ordinary jails also such as that i was confined in it is to be found about three months ago i noticed amongst the prisoners who took exercise with me a young man who seemed to me to be silly or half-witted every prison of course has its half-witted clients who return again and again and may be said to live in the prison but this young man struck me as being more than usually half-witted on account of his silly grin and idiotic laughter to himself and the peculiar restlessness of his eternally twitching hands he was noticed by all the other prisoners on account of the strangeness of his conduct from time to time he did not appear at exercise which showed me that he was being punished by confinement to his cell finally i discovered that he was under observation and being watched night and day by warders when he did appear at exercise he always seemed hysterical and used to walk round crying or laughing at chapel he had to sit right under the observation of two warders who carefully watched him all the time sometimes he would bury his head in his hands an offence against the chapel regulations and his head would be immediately struck up by a warder so that he should keep his eyes fixed permanently in the direction of the communion table sometimes he would cry not making any disturbance but with tears streaming down his face and an hysterical throbbing in the throat sometimes he would grin idiot-like to himself and make faces he was on more than one occasion sent out of chapel to his cell and of course he was continually punished as the bench on which i used to sit in chapel was directly behind the bench at the end of which this unfortunate man was placed i had a full opportunity of observing him i also saw him of course at exercise continually and i saw that he was becoming insane and was being treated as if he was shamming on saturday week last i was in my cell at about one o'clock occupied in cleaning and polishing the tins i had been using for dinner suddenly i was startled by the prison silence being broken by the most horrible and revolting shrieks or rather howls for at first i thought some animal like a bull or a cow was being unskilfully slaughtered outside the prison walls 
i soon realized however that the howls proceeded from the basement of the prison and i knew that some wretched man was being flogged i need not say how hideous and terrible it was for me and i began to wonder who it was who was being punished in this revolting manner suddenly it dawned upon me that they might be flogging this unfortunate lunatic my feelings on the subject need not be chronicled they have nothing to do with the question the next day sunday sixteenth i saw the poor fellow at exercise his weak ugly wretched face bloated by tears and hysteria almost beyond recognition he walked in the centre ring along with the old men the beggars and the lame people so that i was able to observe him the whole time it was my last sunday in prison a perfectly lovely day the finest day we had had the whole year and there in the beautiful sunlight walked this poor creature made once in the image of god grinning like an ape and making with his hands the most fantastic gestures as though he was playing in the air on some invisible stringed instrument or arranging and dealing counters in some curious game all the while these hysterical tears without which none of us ever saw him were making soiled runnels on his white swollen face the hideous and deliberate grace of his gestures made him like an antic he was a living grotesque the other prisoners all watched him and not one of them smiled everybody knew what had happened to him and that he was being driven insane was insane already after half an hour he was ordered in by the warder and i suppose punished at least he was not at exercise on monday though i think i caught sight of him at the corner of the stone yard walking in charge of a warder on the tuesday my last day in prison i saw him at exercise he was worse than before and again was sent in since then i know nothing of him but i found out from one of the prisoners who walked with me at exercise that he had had twenty-four lashes in the cook-house on saturday afternoon by order of the visiting justices on the report of the doctor the howls that had horrified us all were his this man is undoubtedly becoming insane prison doctors have no knowledge of mental disease of any kind they are as a class ignorant men the pathology of the mind is unknown to them when a man grows insane they treat him as shamming they have him punished again and again naturally the man becomes worse when ordinary punishments are exhausted the doctor reports the case to the justices the result is flogging of course the flogging is not done with a cat of nine tails it is what is called birching the instrument is a rod but the result on the wretched half-witted man may be imagined his number is or was a211 i also managed to find out his name it is prince something should be done at once for him he is a soldier and his sentence is one of court-martial the term is six months three have yet to run may i ask you to use your influence to have this case examined into and to see that the lunatic prisoner is properly treated no report by the medical commissioners is of any avail it is not to be trusted the medical inspectors do not seem to understand the difference between idiocy and lunacy between the entire absence of a function or organ and the diseases of a function or organ this man a to eleven will i have no doubt be able to tell his name the nature of his offence the day of the month the date of the beginning and expiration of his sentence and answer any ordinary simple question but that his mind is diseased admits of no doubt at present it is a horrible duel between himself and the doctor the doctor is fighting for a theory the man is fighting for his life i am anxious that the man should win 
but let the whole case be examined into by experts who understand brain disease and by people of humane feelings who have still some common sense and some pity there is no reason that the sentimentalist should be asked to interfere he always does harm the case is a special instance of the cruelty inseparable from a stupid system for the present governor of reading is a man of gentle and humane character greatly liked and respected by all the prisoners he was appointed in july last and though he cannot alter the rules of the prison system he has altered the spirit in which they used to be carried out under his predecessor he is very popular with the prisoners and with the warders indeed he has quite altered the whole tone of the prison life upon the other hand the system is of course beyond his reach as far as altering its rules is concerned i have no doubt that he sees daily much of what he knows to be unjust stupid and cruel but his hands are tied of course i have no knowledge of his real views of the case of a to eleven nor indeed of his views on our present system i merely judge him by the complete change he brought about in reading prison under his predecessor the system was carried out with the greatest harshness and stupidity i remain sir your obedient servant oscar wilde may twenty seven end of section to robert ross twenty eighth of may eighteen ninety seven from after reading this librivox recording is in the public domain hotel de la plage berneval sur mer may twenty eighth eighteen ninety seven my dear robbie this is my first day alone and of course a very unhappy one i begin to realize my terrible position of isolation and i have been rebellious and bitter of heart all day is it not sad i thought i was accepting everything so well and so simply and i have had moods of rage passing over my nature like gusts of bitter wind or storm spoiling the sweet corn or blasting the young shoots i found a little chapel full of the most fantastic saints so ugly and gothic and painted quite gaudily some of them with smiles curved to a rictus almost like primitive things but they all seemed to me to be idols i laughed with amusement when i saw them fortunately there was a lovely crucifix in a side chapel not a jansenist one but with wide-stretched arms of gold i was pleased at that and wandered then by the cliffs where i fell asleep on the warm coarse brown sea-grass i had hardly any sleep last night blank's letter was in the room and foolishly i had read it again and left it by my bedside my dream was that my mother was speaking to me with some sternness and that she was in trouble i quite see that whenever i am in danger she will in some way warn me for yourself dear robbie i am haunted by the idea that many of those who love you will and do think it selfish of me to allow you and wish you to be with me from time to time but still they might see the difference between your going about with me in my days of gilded infamy my neronian hours rich profligate cynical materialistic and your coming to comfort me a lonely dishonoured man in disgrace and obscurity and poverty how lacking in imagination they are if i were rich again and sought to repeat my former life i don't think you would care very much to be with me i think you would regret what i was doing but now dear robbie you come with the heart of christ and you help me intellectually as no one else can or ever could do you are helping me to save my soul alive 
not in the theological sense, but in the plain meaning of the words. For my soul was really dead in the slough of coarse pleasures. My life was unworthy of an artist. You can heal me and help me. No other friend have I now in this beautiful world. I want no other. Yet I am distressed to think that I shall be looked on as careless of your own welfare and indifferent to your own good. You are made to help me. I weep with sorrow when I think how much I need help, but I weep with joy when I think I have you to give it to me. I do hope to do some work in these six weeks, that when you come I shall be able to read you something. I know you love me, but I want to have your respect, your sincere admiration, or rather, for that is a word of ill omen, your sincere appreciation of my effort to recreate my artistic life. But if I have to think that I am harming you, all pleasure in your society will be tainted for me. With you, at any rate, I want to be free of any sense of guilt, the sense of spoiling another's life. Dear Robbie, I couldn't spoil your life by accepting the sweet companionship you offer me from time to time. It is not for nothing that I named you in prison St. Robert of Fillimore. Love can canonize people. The saints are those who have been most loved. I made only one mistake in prison in things that I wrote of you or to you, my poem should have run, When I came out of prison, you met me with garments, with spices, with wise counsel. You met me with love. Not others did it, but you. I really laugh when I think how true in detail the lines are. 8.30 I have just received your telegram. A man, bearded, no doubt for purposes of disguise, dashed up on a bicycle, brandishing a blue telegram. I knew it was from you. Well, I am really pleased, and look forward to the paper. I do think it will help. I now think I shall write my prison article for the Chronicle. It is interested in prison reform, and the thing would not look an advertisement. Let me have your opinion. I intend to write to Massingham. Reading between the lines of your telegram, I seem to discern that you were pleased. The telegram was much needed. They had offered me serpent for dinner. A serpent cut up in an umber-green sauce. I explained that I was not a mangeur de serpent, and have converted the patron. No serpent is now to be served to any guest. He grew quite hot over it. What a good thing it is that I am an experienced ichthyologist. I enclose a lot of letters. Please put money orders in them and send them off. Put those addressed to the prison in a larger envelope, each of them addressed by yourself, if possible, legibly. They are my debts of honour, and I must pay them. Of course, you must read the letters. Explain to Miss Meredith that letters addressed to C-33, 24 Haunton Street, are for you. The money is as follows. Of course, it is a great deal, but I thought I would have lots. Here follows a list of the names of ten of his fellow prisoners at Reading, to whom he wished small sums of money, varying from one pound to three pounds ten shillings, to be sent on their release from prison. The total amount was twenty-two pounds, ten shillings. The letters must go at once, at least those marked. How it mounts up! But now I have merely... They can keep. On second thoughts I have sent only one to the prison. Please be careful not to mix the letters. They are all nuanced. I want some pens and some red ties. The latter for literary purposes, of course. I wrote to Courtney Thorpe this morning, also to Mrs. Stannard, and sent her flowers. Moore forwards me a poem from blank. 
a love lyric. It is absurd. Tardieu has written mysteriously, warning me of dangerous friends in Paris. I hate mystery. It is so obvious. Keep Romica on the war trail. The Figaro announced me bicycling at Dieppe. They always confuse you and me. It really is delightful. I will make no protest. You are the best half of me. I am very tired, and the rain is coming down. You will be glad to hear that I have not been planting cacao in plantain swamps, and that Lloyd is not now sitting on the veranda, nor is Fanny looking after the labour boys, and that of Bell I know nothing. So now, dear Colvin, what an awful pen! I mean, dear Robbie, good night. With all love and affection, yours, Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, 31st of May, 1897. From Oscar Wilde, His Life and Confessions by Frank Harris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hotel de la Plage, Berneval, near Dieppe. Monday night, May 31st, 1897. My dearest Robbie, I have decided that the only way in which to get boots properly is to go to France to receive them. The Duane charged three francs. How could you frighten me as you did? The next time you order boots, please come to Dieppe to get them sent to you. It is the only way, and it will be an excuse for seeing you. I am going tomorrow on a pilgrimage. I always wanted to be a pilgrim, and I have decided to start early tomorrow to the shrine of Notre Dame de Lies. Do you know what Lies is? It is an old word for joy. I suppose the same as Letitia, Letitia. I just heard tonight of the shrine or chapel by chance, as you would say, from the sweet woman of the auberge who wants me to live always at Berneval. She says Notre Dame de Lies is wonderful, and helps everyone to the secret of joy. I do not know how long it will take me to get to the shrine, as I must walk, but from what she tells me it will take at least six or seven minutes to get there, and as many to come back. In fact, the chapel of Notre Dame de Lies is just fifty yards from the hotel. Isn't it extraordinary? I intend to start after I have had my coffee, and then to bathe. Need I say that this is a miracle? I wanted to go on a pilgrimage, and I find the little grey stone chapel of Our Lady of Joy is brought to me. It has probably been waiting for me all these purple years of pleasure, and now it comes to meet me with Lies as its message. I simply don't know what to say. I wish you were not so hard to poor heretics, and would admit that even for the sheep who has no shepherd there is a stellar Maris to guide it home. But you and more, especially more, treat me as a dissenter, it is very painful and quite unjust. Yesterday I attended Mass at ten o'clock and afterwards bathed, so I went into the water without being a pagan. The consequence was that I was not tempted by either sirens or mermaidens, or any of the green-haired following of Glaucus. I really think that this is a remarkable thing— in my pagan days the sea was always full of tritons blowing conchs and other unpleasant things. Now it is quite different. And yet you treat me as the president of Mansfield College, and after I had canonized you too. Dear boy, I wish you would tell me if your religion makes you happy. You conceal your religion from me in a monstrous way, you treat it like writing in the Saturday Review for Pollock, or dining in Wardour Street off the fascinating dish that is served with tomatoes and makes men mad. I know it is useless asking you, so don't tell me. 
I felt an outcast in chapel yesterday. Not really, but a little in exile. I met a dear farmer in a cornfield, and he gave me a seat on his bunk in church, so I was quite comfortable. He now visits me twice a day, and as he has no children, and is rich, I have made him promise to adopt three, two boys and a girl. I told him that if he wanted them, he would find them. He said he was afraid that they would turn out badly. I told him everyone did that. He really has promised to adopt three orphans. He is now filled with enthusiasm at the idea. He is to go to the curé and talk to him. He told me that his own father had fallen down in a fit one day as they were talking together, and that he had caught him in his arms, and put him to bed where he died, and that he himself had often thought how dreadful it was that if he had a fit there was no one to catch him in his arms. It is quite clear that he must adopt orphans, is it not? I feel that Berneval is to be my home. I really do. Notre Dame de Liesse will be sweet to me if I go on my knees to her, and she will advise me. It is extraordinary being brought here by a white horse that was a native of the place, and knew the road, and wanted to see its parents, now of advanced years. It is also extraordinary that I knew Berneval existed, and was arranged for me. Monsieur Bonnet wants to build me a chalet, one thousand metres of ground. I don't know how much that is, but I suppose about a hundred miles. And a chalet with a studio, a balcony, a salle à manger, a huge kitchen, and three bedrooms, a view of the sea and trees, all for twelve thousand francs, four hundred and eighty pounds. If I can write a play, I am going to have it begun. Fancy one's own lovely house and grounds in France for four hundred and eighty pounds, no rent of any kind. Pray consider this, and approve if you think well. Of course, not till I have done my play. An old gentleman lives here in the hotel. He dines alone in his room, and then sits in the sun. He came here for two days, and has stayed two years. His sole sorrow is that there is no theatre. Monsieur Bonnet is a little heartless about this, and says that as the old gentleman goes to bed at eight o'clock, a theatre would be of no use to him. The old gentleman says he only goes to bed at eight o'clock because there is no theatre. They argued the point yesterday for an hour. I sided with the old gentleman, but logic sides with Monsieur Bonnet, I believe. I had a sweet letter from the Sphinx. She gives me a delightful account of Ernest subscribing to Rymicke while his divorce suit was running, and not being pleased with some of the notices. Considering the growing appreciation of Ibsen, I must say that I am surprised the notices were not better, but nowadays everybody is jealous of everyone else, except, of course, husband and wife. I think I shall keep this last remark of mine for my play. Have you got my silver spoon from Reggie? You got my silver brushes out of Humphreys, who is bald, so you might easily get my spoon out of Reggie, who has so many, or used to have. You know my crest is on it. It is a bit of Irish silver, and I don't want to lose it. There is an excellent substitute called Britannia metal, very much liked at the Adelphi and elsewhere. Wilson Barrett writes, I prefer it to silver. It would suit dear Reggie admirably. Walter Besant writes, I use none other. Mr. Beerbohm Tree also writes, Since I have tried it, I am a different actor. My friends hardly recognize me. So there is obviously a demand for it. I am going to write a political economy in my heavier moments. The first law I lay down is, whenever there exists a demand, there is no supply. 
this is the only law that explains the extraordinary contrast between the soul of man and man's surroundings civilizations continue because people hate them a modern city is the exact opposite of what everyone wants nineteenth century dress is the result of our horror of the style the tall hat will last as long as people dislike it dear robbie i wish you would be a little more considerate and not keeping up so late talking to you it is very flattering to me and all that but you should remember that i need rest good night you will find some cigarettes and some flowers by your bedside coffee is served below at eight o'clock do you mind if it is too early for you i don't at all mind lying in bed an extra hour i hope you will sleep well you should as lloyd is not on the veranda tuesday morning nine thirty the sea and sky are opal no horrid drawing master's line between them just one fishing boat going slowly and drawing the wind after it i am going to bathe six o'clock bathed and have seen a chalet here which i wish to take for the season quite charming a splendid view a large writing-room a dining-room and three lovely bedrooms besides servants rooms and also a huge balcony in this blank space he had roughly drawn a ground plan of the imagined chalet i don't know the scale of the drawing but the rooms are larger than the plannies one salle manger two salon three balcony all on ground floor with steps from balcony to ground the rent for the season or year is what do you think thirty two pounds of course i must have it i will take my meals here separate and reserved table it is within two minutes walk do tell me to take it when you come again your room will be waiting for you all i need is a domestique the people here are most kind i made my pilgrimage the interior of the chapel is of course a modern horror but there is a black image of notre dame de liesse the chapel is as tiny as an undergraduate's room at oxford i hope to get the cure to celebrate mass in it soon as a rule the service is only held there in july and august but i want to see a mass quite close there is also another thing i must write to you about i adore this place the whole country is lovely and full of forest and deep meadow it is simple and healthy if i live in paris i may be doomed to things i don't desire i am afraid of big towns here i get up at seven thirty i am happy all day i go to bed at ten i am frightened of paris i want to live here i have seen the terrain it is the best here and the only one left i must build a house if i could build a chalet for twelve thousand francs five hundred pounds and live in a home of my own how happy i would be i must raise the money somehow it would give me a home quiet retired healthy and near england if i live in egypt i know what my life would be if i live in the south of italy i know i should be idle and worse i want to live here do think over this and send me over the architect monsieur bonnet is excellent and is ready to carry out any idea i want a little chalet of wood and plaster walls the wooden beams showing and the white square of plaster diapering the framework like i regret to say shakespeare's house like old english sixteenth century farmers houses so your architect has me waiting for him as he is waiting for me do you think the idea absurd i got the chronicle many thanks i see the writer on prints 
A211, does not mention my name. Foolish of her. It is a woman. I, as you, the poem of my days, are away, am forced to write. I have begun something that I think will be very good. I breakfast tomorrow with the Stannards. What a great, passionate, splendid writer John Strange Winter is. How little people understand her work. Bootle's baby is an oeuvre symboliste. It is really only the style and the subject that are wrong. Pray never speak lightly of Bootle's baby. Indeed, pray never speak of it at all. I never do. Yours, Oscar. Please send a chronicle to my wife. Mrs. C. M. Holland, Maison Bengorel, Bevay, Pré de Neuchâtel. Just marking it, and if my second letter appears, mark that. Also, cut out the letter and enclose it in an envelope to Mr. Arthur Cruthenden, Post Restaurant, GPO, Reading, with just these lines. Dear friend, the enclosed will interest you. There is also another letter waiting in the post office for you from me with a little money. Ask for it if you have not got it. Yours sincerely, C33. I have no one but you, dear Robbie, to do anything. Of course, the letter to Reading must go at once, as my friends come out on Wednesday morning early. End of section. To Ada Leverson, from the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 325. Autograph letter signed. Four pages, small quarto, Dieppe. To Mrs. Leverson. Signed, Oscar. My dear Sphinx, your date of your letter is only June, a date quite accurate enough when a golden rose is writing, when, however, a golden rose states, there is a notice of your letters in the Daily Chronicle today, I am troubled. I am in the public press, sometimes the ex-convict, which is too obvious. Sometimes I am Mr. Oscar Wilde, a phrase I deserve. Sometimes the man Wilde, a phrase I don't, etc. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas. From Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 16. Hotel de la Plage, Berneval sur Mer, Dieppe. My dear boy, if you will send me back beautiful letters with bitter ones of your own, of course you will never remember my address. It is as above. Of Lunia Poe, of course, I know nothing except that he is singularly handsome, and seems to me to have the personality of a good actor, for personality does not require intellect to help it. It is a dynamic force of its own, and is often as superbly unintelligent as the great forces of nature, like the lightning that shook at sudden moments last night over the sea that slept before my window. The production of Salome was the thing that turned the scale in my favour, as far as my treatment in prison by the government was concerned, and I am deeply grateful to all concerned in it. Upon the other hand, I could not give my next play for nothing, as I simply do not know how I shall live after the summer is over, unless I at once make money. I am in a terrible and dangerous position." for money that I had been assured was set aside for me was not forthcoming when I wanted it. It was a horrible disappointment, for I have, of course, begun to live as a man of letters should live, that is, with a private sitting-room and books and the like. I can see no other way of living, if I am to write, though I can see many others, if I am not. If the Lunia Poe can give me no money, of course I shall not consider myself bound to him, but the play in question, 
being religious in surroundings and treatment of subject, is not a play for a run at all. Three performances are the most I think I could expect. All I want is to have my artistic reappearance and my own rehabilitation through art in Paris, not in London. It is a homage and a debt I owe to that great city of art. If anyone else with money would take the play and let Lunia Poe play the part, I would be more than content. In any case, I am not bound, and, what is of more import, the play is not written. I am still trying to finish my necessary correspondence, and to express suitably my deep gratitude to all who have been kind to me. As regards Le Journal, I have the chance to write for it, and will try and get it regularly. I do not like to abonner myself at the office, as I am anxious that my address should not be known. I think I had better do it at Dieppe, from where I get the Echo de Paris. I heard the Jour has had a sort of interview, a false one, with you. This is very distressing as much i don't doubt to you as to me i hope however that it is not the cause of the jewel you hint at once you get to fight jewels in france you have to be always doing it and it is a nuisance i do hope that you will always shelter yourself under the accepted right of any english gentleman to decline a jewel unless, of course, some personal fracas or public insult takes place. Of course, you will never dream of fighting a duel for me. That would be awful, and create the worst and most odious impression. Always write to me about your art and the art of others. It is better to meet on the double peak of Parnassus than elsewhere, I have read your poems with great pleasure and interest, but on the whole your best work is to me still the work you did two years and a half ago, the ballads and bits of the play. Of course your own personality has had for many reasons to express itself directly since then, but I hope you will go on to forms more remote from actual events and passions. One can really as I say in intentions, be far more subjective in an objective form than in any other way. If I were asked of myself as a dramatist, I would say that my unique position was that I had taken the drama, the most objective form known to art, and made it as personal a mode of expression as the lyric or the sonnet, while enriching the characterization of the stage, and enlarging, at any rate in the case of Salome, its artistic horizon. You have real sympathy with the ballad. Pray again return to it. The ballad is the true origin of the romantic drama, and the true predecessors of Shakespeare are not the tragic writers of the Greek or Latin stage, from Aeschylus to Seneca, but the ballad writers of the border, in such a ballad as Gilderoy, one has the prefiguring note of the romance of Romeo and Juliet, different though the plots are. The recurring phrases of Salome, that bind it together like a piece of music with recurring motifs, are, and were to me, the artistic equivalent of the refrains of old ballads. All this is to beg you to write ballads. I do not know whether I have to thank you or more for the books from Paris. Probably both. As I have divided the books, so you must divide the thanks. I am greatly fascinated by the Napoleon of La Jeunesse. He must be most interesting. André Gide's book fails to fascinate me. The egoistic note is, of course, and always has been to me, the primal and ultimate of note of modern art. But to be an egoist, one must have an ego. It is not everyone who says, I, I, who can enter into the kingdom of art. But I love André personally very deeply, and often thought of him in prison, 
as I often did of dear Reggie Chumley, with large fawn's eyes and honey-sweet smile. Give him my fondest love. Ever yours, Oscar. Kindly forward enclosed card to Reggie, with my address. Tell him to keep both a secret. End of section. To Robert Ross, 2nd of June, from After Reading. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wednesday, June 2nd. Dear Robbie, I have to pay half the rent of my chalet now, and also to pay other things. Kindly send me forty pounds. I must establish myself. I have determined to finish the Florentine tragedy and to get five hundred pounds from it, from somewhere, America, perhaps. I will answer your letter tomorrow. Blank has written, for him, nicely, on literature and my play. Yours, Oscar. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas from Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 17 Thursday, 2.30 My dear boy, I have just received three copies of Le Jour that I ordered from Dieppe. Not knowing what day the supposed interview with you had taken place, I had ordered the numbers for Friday, Saturday and Sunday. The interview is quite harmless, and I am really sorry you took any notice of it. I do hope it is not with the low-class journalist that you are to fight, if that absurd experience is in store for you. If you ever fight in France, let it be with someone who exists. To fight with the dead is either a vulgar farce or a revolting tragedy. Let me know by telegram if anything has happened— the telegraph office is at Dieppe, but they send out on swift bicycles men in fantastic dresses of the middle-class age, who blow horns all the time so that the moon shall hear them. The costume of the Moyen Age is lovely, but the dress of the middle-class age is dreadful. Let me beg one thing of you. Please always... Let me see anything that appears about myself in the Paris papers, good or bad, but especially the bad. It is a matter of vital import to me to know the attitude of the community. All mystery enrages me, and when dear Moore wrote to say that a false interview with you of no importance had been published, I hired a voiture at once and galloped to Dieppe to try and find it, and ordered, as I have told you, three separate numbers. It wrecks my nerves to think of things appearing on me that are kept from me. If Moore had enclosed it in his letter, I would have been happy and satisfied. As it was, I was really unnerved. The smallest word about me tells. If Le Journal would publish my letter to the Daily Chronicle, it would be a great thing for me. I hope you have seen it. Ernest Dowson, Condor, and Dal Young, what a name, are coming out to dine and sleep. At least I know they dine, but I believe they don't sleep. Ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, 3rd of June, 1897. From After Radding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thursday, June 3rd, 2.45 p.m. Berneval time. Latitude and longitude not marked on the sea. A.D. 1897. Dear Robbie, the entirely business-like tone of your letter just received makes me nervous that you are prey of terrible emotions, and that it is merely a form of the calm that hides a storm. You remark also that my letter is undated, while, as a reproach, it wounds me. 
also seems to denote a change in your friendship towards me i have now put the date and other facts at the head of my letter i get no cuttings from paris which makes me irritable when i hear of things appearing not knowing the day of the false interview with blank i ordered fortunately copies of the paper for three successive days they have just arrived and i see an impertinent dementi of blank's denial blank has also written to me to say he is on the eve of a jewel i suppose about this they said his costume was ridicule i have written to him to beg him never to fight jewels as once one does it one has to go on and though it is not dangerous like our english cricket or football still it is a tedious game to be always playing besides to fight with the common interviewer is to fight with the dead a thing either farcical or tragic ernest dowson conder and dal young come out here this afternoon to dine and sleep at least i know they dine but i believe they never sleep i think the chronicle people are nervous they have not answered yet on anything of course with them i am all right if they take my work who is my receiver i want his name and address yours oscar End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, 4th of June. From Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Lord Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 18. Friday, June 4th, 2.30. My dear boy, I have just got your letter but ernest dowson dal young and conder are here so i cannot read it except the last three lines i love the last words of anything the end in art is the beginning don't think i don't love you of course i love you more than anyone else but our lives are irreparably severed as far as meeting goes what is left to us is the knowledge that we love each other and every day i think of you and i know you are a poet and that makes you doubly dear and wonderful my friends here have been most sweet to me and i like them all very much young is the best of fellows and ernest has a most interesting nature he is to send me some of his work we all stayed up till three o'clock very bad for me but it was a delightful experience Today is a day of sea fog and rain, my first. Tomorrow I go with fishers to fish, but I will write to you tonight. Ever, dear boy, with fondest love. Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, 7th of June, from After Reading. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. June 7th My dear Robbie, I have taken the villa, but I have to pay seventeen pounds ten shillings down, the rest in October. I cannot understand why you don't see how much cheaper it is for me to have a villa than to live here. Also, I do not work well in a hotel. You had better let me have a hundred pounds i will keep it at dieppe it has been to me a great inconvenience being without any money as till i pay seventeen pounds ten shillings they will not warm or paper the villa for me so now i have to wait i suppose for a week more unless the forty pounds is payable at sight so if you have sent me forty pounds as i hope through my telegram of this morning kindly send sixty pounds also then i shall always be able to draw directly on my money without worrying you i have engaged a servant at thirty-five francs a month a nice simple fellow who thinks it a godsend he will clean my room and clothes and make my coffee i shall have my meals here 
blank telegraphs daily this is an exaggeration but i made him wire about the jewel which has ended well no jewel dal young was here on thursday and stayed the night with dowson and conder yours oscar end of section to robert ross fifth and sixth of june from after reading this librivox recording is in the public domain saturday june fifth my dear robbie i propose to live at berneval i will not live in paris nor in algiers nor in southern italy surely a house for a year if i choose to continue there at thirty-two pounds is absurdly cheap i could not live cheaper at an hotel you are penny foolish and pound foolish a dreadful state for any financier to be in i told monsieur bonnet that my bankers were messrs ross essier banquier celebre de londres and now you suddenly show me that you really have no place among the great financial people and are afraid of any investment over thirty-one pounds ten shillings it is merely the extra ten shillings that baffles you as regards people living on me in the extra bedrooms dear boy there is no one who would stay with me but you and you will pay your own bill at the hotel for meals and as for your room the charge will be nominally two francs fifty a night but there will be lots of extras such as bougie bain and hot water all cigarettes smoked in the bedroom are charged extra washing is extra and if anyone does not take the extras of course he is charged more bain twenty-five centimes pas de bain fifty centimes cigarettes dans les chambres à coucher ten centimes chaque cigarette pas de cigarette dans les chambres à coucher twenty centimes chaque cigarette this is the system in all good hotels if reggie comes of course he will pay a little more i cannot forget that he gave me a dressing case sphinxes pay a hundred per cent more than anyone else they always did in ancient egypt architects on the other hand are taken at a reduction i have special terms for architects but seriously robbie if any people stayed with me of course they would pay their pension at the hotel they would have to except architects a modern architect like modern architecture doesn't pay but then i know only one architect and you are hiding him somewhere from me i am beginning to believe that he is as extinct as the dado of which now only fossil remains are found chiefly in the vicinity of brompton where they are sometimes discovered by workmen excavating they are usually embedded in the old lincruster walton strata and are rare consequently i visited monsieur la cure to-day he has a charming house and a jardin potager he showed me over the church to-morrow i sit in the choir by his special invitation he showed me all his vestments to-morrow he really will be charming in his red he knows i am a heretic and believes that pusey is still alive he says that god will convert england on account of england's kindness to le prêtre exil at the time of the revolution it is to be the reward of that sea-lashed island stained-glass windows are wanted in the church he has only six fourteen more are needed he gets them at three hundred francs twelve pounds a window in paris i was nearly offering half a dozen but remembered you and so only gave him something pour le pauvre you had a narrow escape robbie you should be thankful i hope the forty pounds is on its way and that the sixty pounds will follow i am going to hire a boat it will save walking and so be an economy in the end dear robbie i must start well if the life of st francis awaits me i shall not be angry worse things might happen 
Yours, Oscar. Sunday evening, June 6th. Dear Robbie, by all means, if Edward Strangman will let me know, I will make arrangements. He, of course, will stay here the night. There is no way of getting back to Dieppe. The hotel is quite comfortable, as you know. Let him come on his way to Paris, if possible. I hope something will come of it, though of course I would sooner have a new play of mine as my new debut. I went to Mass at ten o'clock, and to Vespers at three o'clock. The old curé is now devoted to me. I really don't know whether I should tell him that I am in great disgrace. I think I must do so tomorrow. He called at five o'clock, and insisted on going a walk by the sea with me. He thinks me volontaire, but extremely good. It is quite distressing. I am really in wonderful health. My days are occupied largely with letter-writing, but I can't help that. I get exercise at intervals. I am very sorry, but you must put a one-pound postal order, or whatever it is called, into enclosed letter, and send it. Read the letter, and you will see I must do it. It makes me sick to think that A211 has been flogged again. It fills me with despair. Till I get the money, the chalet is vacant. I await tomorrow's post. Don't be nervous. I have many irons and a huge fire. But to work I must be isolated. In a few weeks the English will land here. I am afraid. Ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, 6th of June. From Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 19. Sunday night, June 6th. My dearest boy, I must give up this absurd habit of writing to you every day. It comes, of course, from the strange new joy of talking to you daily. But next week I must make a resolution to write to you only every seven days, and then on the question of the relations of the sonnet to modern life, and the importance of your writing romantic ballads, and the strange beauty of that lovely line of Rossetti's, suppressed till lately by his brother, where he says that the sea ends in a sad blueness beyond rhyme. Don't you think it lovely? In a sad blueness beyond rhyme. Voila! Le influence du bleu dans les arts, with a vengeance. I am so glad you went to bed at seven o'clock. Modern life is terrible to vibrating, delicate frames like yours. A rose leaf in a storm of hard hail is not so fragile. With us who are modern, it is the scabbard that wears out the sword. Will you do this for me? Get Le Courrier de la Presse to procure a copy of Le Soir, the Brussels paper, somewhere between the 26th and the 31st of May last, which has an article on my letter in the Chronicle, a translation of it, I believe, and notices. It is of vital importance for me to have it as soon as possible. My Chronicle letter is to be published as a pamphlet with a postscript, and I need the soir. I don't want to write myself for it, for obvious reasons. Dear boy, I hope you are still sweetly asleep. You are so absurdly sweet when you are asleep. I have been to Mass at ten o'clock and to Vespers at three o'clock. I was a little bored by a sermon in the morning, but benediction was delightful. I am seated in the choir. I suppose sinners should have the high places near Christ's altar. I know at any rate that Christ would not turn me out. Remember, after a few days, only one letter a week. I must school myself to it. In attendant, yours with all love, Oscar. Poet for ça. End of section.
to robert ross eighth to the thirteenth of june from after reading this librivox recording is in the public domain tuesday morning nine thirty june eighth my dear robbie on receipt of your cheque yesterday i went at once in a voiture to dieppe need i say that the banks were all closed they always are in france and no one seems to mind it was a pentecote festival so back i had to come with the cheque to-morrow i breakfast at the stannards and will give the cheque to the bank of course it will take three days to clear it so i shall not be able to get the money till monday next the fourteenth at earliest you see i wrote for it on thursday the third so it takes ten days to get money in the meanwhile i cannot have even a fire lit in the chalet i have to pay half the rent down so i shall not be able to get into it for about a fortnight as the sitting-room has to be papered at the proprietor's expense of course the salt air and salt wind have left it in fluttering strips now you see how right i am to want my money here the want of it simply overwhelms me with expense so let me have the sixty pounds don't think dear robbie i am going to depend on you or other good friends i have great schemes on but i require my house overhead here is a lady with two children perfect darlings and their racket is appalling there is no peace except in one's own home this is a scrawl yours oscar tuesday evening berneval sur mer june eighth dear robbie i am greatly distressed to learn from your letter that you received three letters from me in one morning how awful of course it is the result of english sunday i will no longer write to you in the temporal vicinity of that day i will simply send you twice a week my berneval day by day if the daily chronicle cares you might arrange for simultaneous publication in its columns will rothenstein is organizing a pilgrimage to the sinner this week he brings as his offering silent songs in stone s m thursday june tenth thanks dear robbie for your letter dal young is a dear simple nice fellow i am very fond of him and grateful to him the ties have arrived the excitement at berneval is great in consequence s m friday three thirty june eleventh cafe suisse dieppe dear robbie will rothenstein and strangman arrived yesterday strangman is a charming fellow he has just left for paris w r stays till to-morrow the weather is lovely i bathed this morning the chalet will be ready on wednesday your room has a balcony and a bed please use postcards when you have no news they are so private s m sunday june thirteenth dear robbie thank you so much for red ties and scarlet sonnets i move into my chalet on wednesday i observed a slight tendency to mrs daubney's ailments but you are all right now have just seen a premiere communion very sweet and flower-like with children the cure's hopes are at their highest said non sum dignus s m End of section to frank harris thirteenth of june eighteen ninety seven from oscar wilde his life and confessions by frank harris this librivox recording is in the public domain from monsieur sebastian melmoth hotel de la plage berneval sur mer dieppe june thirteenth ninety seven my dear frank i know you do not like writing letters 
but still I think you might have written me a line in answer, or acknowledgment, of my letter to you from Dieppe. I am thinking of a story to be called The Silence of Frank Harris. I have, however, heard during the last few days that you do not speak of me in the friendly manner I would like. This distresses me very much. I am told that you are hurt with me because my letter of thanks to you was not sufficiently elaborated in expression. This I can hardly credit. It seems so unworthy of a big, strong nature like yours that knows the realities of life. I told you I was grateful to you for your kindness to me. Words now, to me, signify things, actualities, real emotions, realised thoughts. I learnt in prison to be grateful. I used to think gratitude a burden. Now I know that it is something that makes life lighter as well as lovelier for one. I am grateful for a thousand things, from my good friends down to the sun and the sea. But I cannot say more than that I am grateful. I cannot make phrases about it. For me to use such a word shows an enormous development in my nature. Two years ago I did not know the feeling the word denotes. Now I know it, and I am thankful that I have learned that much, at any rate, by having been in prison. But I must say again that I no longer make roulades of phrases about the deep things I feel. When I write directly to you, I speak directly. Violin variations don't interest me. I am grateful to you. If that does not content you, then you do not understand what you of all men should understand, how sincerity of feeling expresses itself. But I dare say the story told of you is untrue. It comes from so many quarters that it probably is. I am told also that you were hurt because I did not go on the driving tour with you. You should understand that in telling you that it was impossible for me to do so, I was thinking as much of you as of myself. To think of the feelings and happiness of others is not an entirely new emotion in my nature. I would be unjust to myself and my friends if I said it was. But I think of those things far more than I used to do, if I had gone with you, you would not have been happy, nor enjoyed yourself, nor would I. You must try to realise what two years' cellular confinement is, and what two years of absolute silence means to a man of my intellectual power. To have survived at all, to have come out sane in mind and sound of body, is a thing so marvellous to me that it seems to me sometimes not that the age of miracles is over, but that it is just beginning, that there are powers in God and powers in man of which the world has up to the present known little. But while I am cheerful, happy, and have sustained to the full that passionate interest in life and art that was the dominant chord of my nature, and made all modes of existence and all forms of expression utterly fascinating to me always, still I need rest, quiet, and often complete solitude. Friends have come to see me here for a day, and have been delighted to find me like my old self, in all intellectual energy and sensitiveness to the play of life, but it has always proved afterwards to have been a strain upon a nervous force, much of which has been destroyed. I have now no storage of nervous force. When I expend what I have in an afternoon, nothing remains. I look to quiet, to a simple mode of existence, to nature in all the infinite meanings of an infinite word, to charge the cells for me. Every day, if I meet a friend, or write a letter longer than a few lines, or even read a book that makes, as all fine books do, a direct claim on me, a direct appeal, an intellectual challenge of any kind. I am utterly exhausted in the evening, 
and often sleep badly and yet it is three whole weeks since i was released had i gone with you on the driving tour where we would have of necessity been in immediate contact with each other from dawn to sunset i would have certainly broken off the tour the third day probably broken down the second you would have then found yourself in a pitiable position your tour would have been arrested at its outset your companion would have been ill without doubt perhaps might have needed care and attendance in some little remote french village you would have given it to me i know but i felt it would have been wrong stupid and thoughtless of me to have started an expedition doomed to swift failure and perhaps fraught with disaster and distress you are a man of dominant personality your intellect is exigent more so than that of any man i ever knew your demands on life are enormous you require response or you annihilate the pleasure of being with you is in the clash of personality the intellectual battle the war of ideas to survive you one must have a strong brain an assertive ego a dynamic character in your luncheon parties in the old days the remains of the guests were taken away with the debris of the feast i have often lunched with you in park lane and found myself the only survivor i might have driven on the white roads or through the leafy lanes of france with a fool or with the wisest of all things a child with you it would have been impossible you should thank me sincerely for having saved you from an experience that each of us would have always regretted will you ask me why then when i was in prison i accepted with grateful thanks your offer my dear frank i don't think you will ask so thoughtless a question the prisoner looks to liberty as an immediate return to all his ancient energy quickened into more vital forces by long disuse when he goes out he finds he has still to suffer his punishment as far as its effects go lasts intellectually and physically just as it lasts socially he has still to pay one gets no receipt for the past when one walks out into the beautiful air i have now spent the whole of my sunday afternoon the first real day of summer we have had in writing to you this long letter of explanation i have written directly and simply i need not tell the author of elder conklin that sweetness and simplicity of expression take more out of one than fiddling harmonics on one string i felt it my duty to write but it has been a distressing one it would have been better for me to have lain in the brown grass on the cliff or to have walked slowly by the sea it would have been kinder of you to have written to me directly about whatever harsh or hurt feelings you may have about me it would have saved me an afternoon of strain and tension but i have something more to say it is pleasanter to me now to write about others than about myself the enclosed is from a brother prisoner of mine released june fourth pray read it you will see his age offence and aim in life if you can give him a trial do so if you see your way to this kind action and write to him to come and see you kindly state in your letter that it is about a situation he may think otherwise that it is about the flogging of a two eleven a thing that does not interest you and about which he is a little afraid to talk if the result of this long letter will be that you will help this fellow prisoner of mine to a place in your service i shall consider my afternoon better spent than any afternoon for the last two years and three weeks in any case i have now written to you fully on all things as reported to me i again assure you of my gratitude for your kindness to me during my imprisonment and on my release and am always your sincere friend and admirer oscar wilde 
with regard to lawley all soldiers are neat and smart and make capital servants he would be a good groom he is i believe a third hussar's man he was a quiet well-conducted chap in reading always naturally i replied to this letter at once saying that he had been misinformed that i was not angry and if i could do anything for him i should be delighted i did my best too for lawley End of section. To Robert Ross, 15th of June, 1897, from the Catalogue of the Delau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 15. Not published in either the English or the American editions. Postcard. Signed S.M. 13 lines. We print it here in full. Five pounds, five shillings. Tuesday, June 15th. 1897, Berneval. Dear Robbie, you have never told me anything about the typewriter or my letter. Pray let there be no further conspiracies. I feel apprehensive. It is only by people writing to me the worst that I can know the best. Also, could all the remainder of my money be transferred to Dieppe? I thought you had it all, but you say not. The new review portrait of the Queen is wonderful. I am going to hang it on the walls of the chalet. Every poet should gaze at the portrait of his Queen all day long. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, 15th to the 17th of June. From Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 20 Tuesday, 15th June, Berneval sur mer My own dear boy, who posts your letters? Does anyone? Or do you ever really know the day of the month? I rarely do myself, and Ernest Dowson, who is here, never. The reason of these tedious questions is that last night on coming from aigle la bataille where i had been breakfasting with ernest i found a letter from you dated june eleventh that is last friday but posted june thirteenth last sunday i have kept the envelope for you you ask me in it to let you come on saturday but dear honey sweet boy i have already asked you to come then so we both have the same desire, as usual. Your name is to be Jonquil du Vallon. Will you write at once to Edward Strangman, Hotel Terminus, Gare Saint-Lazare, to say you would like to see him and have news of me? He is a very gentle, rather shy chap. Irish by race, Oxford by culture, a friend of Will Rothenstein and Robbie, and a good friend of mine. He has just sent me lovely books I needed. Pray let him know that I was so touched and pleased by his visit. I suppose I shall hear at length from you to-day. The facteur comes at twelve o'clock and leaves at once, so all I can ever write in immediate response is a green-grey postcard. Only wine will induce the facteur to wait. Nothing else has any influence with him. Always devotedly, yours, Oscar. Letter 21 Wednesday, June 16th, Berneval My dear boy, I am upset with the idea that you don't get my letters, or that the post goes wrong, or something. I dare say it is all absurd, but your last three letters, dated the 10th, 11th, and 12th, whereas we are now at the 16th, contain no references to things i asked you especially as regards our meeting i have asked you to come here on saturday i have a bathing costume for you but you would better get one in paris also bring me a lot of books and cigarettes i cannot get good cigarettes here or at dieppe the weather is very hot so you will want a straw hat and flannels 
i hope you will get quietly out of paris on arriving at dieppe take a good voiture and tell him to drive to the hotel bonnet berneval sur mer and go by the road to puisse not by the grand route which is a straight line of white dust if you want a cafe at dieppe on arriving go to the cafe suisse it takes an hour and a half to get here so arrive if you can at dieppe about three o'clock and be here at five o'clock i hope to be in my chalet by saturday so you will stay with me there i have a little walled-in place in the garden of the hotel where i have dejeuner and dinner a bouquet of trees on sunday i go to mass in a dark blue suit you must not have your letters sent on under your own name it might do me serious harm i still suggest for the third time jonquil du vallon but any name you like will do pray do not fail to write at once on receipt of this and be careful of the date your last letter is dated the twelfth which was last saturday it is lovely here to-day and i am going to bathe at ten thirty yesterday i drove ernest dowson back to aim i like him immensely thanks for the soir you ask me other questions in your letter that i have answered in letters of my own to you but i don't know if they reach you i will wait for to-day's post and write again to-morrow bring also some perfumes and nice things from the cellars of the dust of roses also bring yourself ever yours oscar letter twenty two thursday june seventeenth two o'clock p m my dearest boy i have been obliged to ask my friends to leave me as i am so upset and distressed in nerve by my solicitor's letter and the apprehension of serious danger that simply i must be alone i find that any worry utterly destroys my health and makes me horrid and irritable and unkind though i hate to be so of course at present it is impossible for us to meet i have to find out what grounds my solicitor has for his sudden action and of course if your father or rather q as i only know him and think of him if q came over and made a scene and scandal it would utterly destroy my possible future and alienate all my friends from me i owe to my friends everything including the clothes i wear and i would be wretched if i did anything that would separate them from me so simply we must write to each other about the things we love about poetry and the coloured arts of our age and that passage of ideas into images that is the intellectual's history of art i think of you always and love you always but chasms of moonless night divide us we cannot cross it without hideous and nameless peril later on when the alarm in england is over when secrecy is possible and silence forms part of the world's attitude we may meet but at present you see it is impossible i would be harassed agitated nervous it would be no joy for me to let you see me as i am now you must go to some place where you can play golf and get back your lily and rose don't like a good boy telegraph to me unless on a matter of vital import the telegraph office is seven miles off and i have to pay the facteur and also reply and yesterday with three separate facteurs and three separate replies i was sans les sous and also mentally upset in nerve say please to percy that i will accept a bicycle with many thanks for his kindness i want to get it here where there is a great champion who teaches everyone and has english machines it will cost fifteen pounds if percy will send me fifteen pounds to enclose name and address in a cheque it will make me very happy 
send him my card ever your rather maimed and mutilated oscar end of section to robert ross eighteenth of june eighteen ninety seven from the catalogue of the de Lau collection this librivox recording is in the public domain lot sixteen not published in either the english or the american editions postcard signed s m ten lines we print it here in full four pounds four shillings friday june eighteenth eighteen ninety seven dear robbie check arrived safe this morning i don't know how to thank you and more for your wonderful kindness and care of my life and interests so i write on a postcard as all expression is forbidden by the postal authorities the postcard is the only mode of silence left to us we'll write to you to-morrow blank is not here nor is he to come end of section to robert ross nineteenth to the twenty first of june from after reading this librivox recording is in the public domain saturday june nineteenth ten thirty a m my dear robbie i took advantage of the postcard system yesterday to thank you for the cheque and for all the wonderful kindness you and more have shown me so is reticence in art taught to one i have not received my cheque from hansel yet i suspect that he is keeping it for hansel i suppose you know that he has resigned his position and will not act for me any more he writes a mysterious letter about private information i have been so harassed and indeed frightened at the thought of a possible scandal or trouble the french papers describe me going about at longchamp with blank at horse races so that must suffice for evil tongues thanks for b two three's letter he was a good fellow though not one of my intimate friends we never talked but i saw him daily it is most kind of you to say that you will let him have one pound but i must add ten shillings of my own my friends are good to me and i must help others a little so will you place thirty shillings in enclosed letter and send it of course read all letters that come for me or that i send you as regards blank of course he should stay in london it would be cheaper for him let him have a room in haunton street not at twenty-four of course but hard by and report on him i have never seen him so my interest is abstract i get into the chalet on monday now it is the chalet bourgeat but always address berneval sur mer simply as the facteur comes at twelve thirty while i am breakfasting here and i read my budget over my coffee it is very annoying that he cannot wait to get my replies nothing in the world will induce him to wait except wine and that he drains with such speed that a couple of postcards is all that i can ever get off the books have not yet come i expect them to-day i wish you would send me a e w mason's philanderers macmillan he is an old friend i have been so worried wiring all day long and hensel throwing up my interests that i am not well i simply cannot stand worry i hope you are all right again i am sure that you are wonderfully cheerful wonderfully cheerful ever yours oscar monday june twenty first dear robbie just a line to wish you a very happy jubilee and many of them i fear i cannot hope to live long enough to see more than five or six more myself but with you it is different 
I don't know the exact route of the procession, but I suppose the dear Queen passes by Upper Fillimore Gardens, and will look up and see you waving the flags of no nations. Of course we are having Queen's weather here. It began today. Yesterday nothing but the prayers at Vipre prevented it from snowing. S.M. End of section. To Lord Alfred Douglas, 23rd of June. From Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 23. Wednesday, June 23rd. My darling boy, thanks for your letter received this morning. My fate was a huge success. Fifteen gamins were entertained on strawberries and cream, apricots, chocolates, cakes, and sirop de grenadine. I had a huge iced cake with jubile de la reine Victoria in pink sugar just rosetted with green, and a great wreath of red roses round it all. Every child was asked beforehand to choose his present. They all chose instruments of music. Six accordions, five trompettes, four clarons. They sang the Marseillaise and other songs, and danced a ronde, and also played God Save the Queen. They said it was God Save the Queen, and I did not like to differ from them. They also all had flags which I gave them, they were most gay and sweet. I gave the health of la reine d'Angleterre, and they cried, Vive la reine d'Angleterre. Then I gave la France, mère de tous les artistes, and finally I gave le président de la République. I thought I had better do so. They cried out with one accord, Vive le président de la République et Monsieur Melmoth. So I found my name coupled with that of the President. It was an amusing experience, as I am hardly more than a month out of jail. They stayed from 4.30 to 7 o'clock and played games. On leaving, I gave them each a basket with a jubilee cake, frosted pink and inscribed, and bonbon. They seemed to have made a great demonstration in bernevaux le grand and to have gone to the house of the mayor and cried, Vive Monsieur la Mer, Vive la Reine d'Angleterre, Vive Monsieur Melmoth. I tremble at my position. Today I have come in with Ernest Dowson to dine with the painter Taulo, a giant with the temperament of Corro. I sleep here and go back tomorrow. I will write tomorrow on things. Ever, dearest boy, your Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, 28th of June and 6th of July. From After Reading. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Monday, June 28th. Dear Robbie, Blank has sent me a long indictment of you and panegyric of himself, to which I will reply tomorrow. You can understand in what tone I shall answer him. But for you, dear friend, I don't know in what black abyss of want I would have been. I should not write this on a postcard, but my handwriting is as illegible as yours is. S. M. Berneval sur Mer, July 6th. Dearest Robbie, I have had no time to write lately but I have written a long letter of twelve foolscap pages to blank, to point out that I owe everything to you and your friends, and that whatever life I have as an artist in the future will be due to you. He has now written to me a temperate letter. I also wrote to him about him calling himself a grand seigneur, in comparison to a dear sweet wonderful friend like you, his superior in all fine things. I told him how grotesque, ridiculous, and vulgar such an attempt was. I long to see you. When are you coming over? I have a lovely bedroom for more, and a small garret for you, with my heart waiting in it for you. 
the photograph of constance has arrived it was most sweet of you to send it she writes to me every week ernest dowson is here for a few days he leaves to-morrow he stays at arc la bataille could you send me my pictures would it cost much i long for them to-day is stormy and wet but my chalet is delightful and when i pass through berneval le grand they still cry vivant monsieur melmot et la reine d'angleterre it is an astonishing position with best love ever yours oscar end of section To Lord Alfred Douglas, from Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter 24. Wednesday, 7th. My darling boy, I received your letters all right, and have half written my answer. I write now on nicer things, just to know how you are and why you stay at a place that bores you. I hear from Ernest Dowson that Montigny-sur-Loire is lovely, and full of dear brilliant artists and sweet people. Stuart Merrill lives at Marlotte, only three miles off, and of course is charming and sympathetic. I hate to know you are lonely, or in danger of ennui, that enemy of modern life. I am waiting here for a new servant, sent to me from Aven. I have not yet seen him, but I hope he will be nice. He is to come here to find me. Brutes, bald and bearded, have arrived, and Ernest Dowson says he is sure my servant is among them. It is so awful that I am going to deny I am Miss your Sebastian Melmoth. Tell me about your days. Is Gaston in waiting? Are you writing anything? Whom have you met? Tomorrow I am going to write my poem. I will send it to you. With my love, dearest boy, ever your Oscar. Do you know Hugues Rebel? He has just sent me his book, Nikina. Also Tristan Clingsom, who sends poems. His name is so lovely, I fear I shall be disappointed with his work. In fact, I am. End of section. To Robert Ross, from the Catalogue of the Dalau Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 21. Not published in Beaumont. Postcard. Signed, S.M. Nine lines. We print in full. Four pounds, ten shillings. Monday. Dear Robbie, don't mind about blank. He is absurd. Let me know about more. Is he better? I never hear from you, but blank says you have apologised. Is this true? I intend to write today, which accounts for the illegible scrawl I send you. Lot 22. Entirely unpublished. Postcard signed S.M. Fourteen lines. We print in full. Five pounds, five shillings. Wednesday, July 14th, 1897, Berneval. Blank's letter most satisfactory, except his communicating with blank, which means, of course, a possible estrangement between myself and blank. If he is arbiter, he is arbiter. To inform them of his decision, previous to events contemplated or not contingent, seems like giving himself away. Your letters always arrive underpaid. I paid fifty centimes yesterday and one franc last week. Do buy a paperweight, as you were clearly two pound in pocket by blank. Not calling at the P.O., you might send me a twenty-five shilling Waterbury watch. I have no clock or watch, and the sun is always hours in advance. I rely on the unreliable moon. Lot 23. Entirely unpublished. Postcard signed S.M. We print in full. Three pounds, three shillings. Berneval, July 19th, 1897. 
dear robbie what delightful news i expect you on august first bring dear moore if he can come if not bring the architect of the moon i have a lot of work on hand for you to do literary work of course where is my waterbury i never know the time end of section to robert ross nineteenth of july from after reading this librivox recording is in the public domain monday july nineteenth dear robbie i should think that fifty pounds would be enough for the insurance of my pictures i hope to get them soon as my chalet is bare of beauty in art with the exception of a vierge en bois sculpté from the boat of an old fisherman a lovely thing and storm vexed s m end of section to robert ross twentieth of july version one from after reading this librivox recording is in the public domain chalet bourget berneval sur mer july twentieth my dearest robbie your excuse of domesticity is of course most treacherous i have missed your letters very much pray write at least twice a day and write at length you write now only about blank. as regards him tell him that the expense of bringing him to london is too heavy i don't think i would like the typewritten manuscript sent to him it might be dangerous better to have it done in london scratching out blank's name mine at the close and the address mrs marshall can be relied on the pictures as i said insure for fifty pounds as regards blank i feel that you have been as usual forbearing and sweet and too good-tempered i expect you on august the first also the architect the poem is nearly finished some of the verses are awfully good windham comes here to-morrow to see me for the adaptation of scribe's le verre d'eau which of course you have to do bring esmond with you and any queen anne chairs you have just for the style i am so glad more is better the sketch of frank harris in john john's is superb who wrote the book it is a wonderful indictment yours oscar end of section to robert ross version two from the catalogue of the dalau collection this librivox recording is in the public domain lot twenty five after reading forty eight eight pages small octavo one page line thirteen after good tempered eighteen lines admitted i wish you would be strong on this point the thing should be thrashed out of him as for his coarse ingratitude in abusing you to whom as i have told him i owe any possibility of a new and artistic career and indeed of life at all i have no words in which to express my contempt for his lack of imaginative insight and his dullness of sensitive nature it makes me quite furious so pray write when next you do so quite calmly and say that you will not allow any nonsense and that if he cannot understand you have no desire to hear from him again thirty five pounds the reference in this letter to the poem which is nearly finished is the first mention in this correspondence of the ballad of reading jail he says the poem is nearly finished some of the verses are awfully good end of section to robert ross twentieth of july from the catalogue of the dalau collection this librivox recording is in the public domain lot twenty seven unpublished in beaumont postcard signed s m we print it here in full three pounds ten shillings july twentieth j 
just closed up my letter without this important request. Will you kindly insert once in the Times, once in the Daily Telegraph, and three times in the Manchester Guardian, the following? Mr. Jules Hammond, late of the Foreign Legion, serving in Tonkin, is earnestly requested to communicate with Monsieur Achille Fromentin, 84th Regiment, Aven Nord. Two medals are waiting for Monsieur Jules Hammond at the Gendarmerie Calais. You will do a great service to one of my best friends. End of section. To Robert Ross, 20th to the 26th of July, from After Reading. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Berneval-sur-Mer, Près Dieppe, July 20th. I have not yet heard from you which books are from your generous and gracious hand. The rose petals are waiting to mark them. Could you get me something in London I want very much? Do you know that Japanese cloth of gold, made, I believe, of papier-mâché, with no design on it, or with one very close to the fabric and unimportant? Not too bright? Rather dull? If so, would you get me a piece about two yards square? I want a background to put lithographs in passepartout on, things by Shannon and Will Rothenstein, and wallpapers are dreary or hopeless. I feel that for white drawings a gold background is vital. I will nail it up on the wall and look at the songs in stone. If you can do this for me, it would be most kind of you. Please send it over here and let me know the cost, of course. I don't fancy it will be much. If gold cannot be got, could you get me a good brown in some rough material? But remember, the drawings are on white paper. Your sincere friend, Sebastian Melmoth. Berneval sur Mer, July 22nd. No letter from you today. I suspect that domesticity is dominating. Also, no Waterbury. Do send me one. The Duane is perfectly easy. A nickel watch is what I long for. Silver is bimetallic. I never know the time, and my poem goes all wrong, consequently, though it aims at eternity. Also, the pictures don't arrive. I feel some other influence is dulling a youth full of promises. Wyndham is to arrive, he says, today. So you must begin to be Queen Anne style at once. S. M. Friday, July 23rd. Just had a wire from Wyndham to say he comes over today to see me, but must leave tonight again. Please send my pictures at once. I cannot leave them in London. Ask Chapman if the pastel would not be safer without the glass. The glass is the only danger, and I can get one at Dieppe. But I am wretched without my things. I want to have my chalet like Le Home. Please do this. S.M. Saturday, July 24th. Dear Robbie, I saw Wyndham yesterday. He came for three hours, and now I feel I can do the play pretty well, as he leaves me carte blanche to pull it about as I like. You are quite right about Congreve. Fortunately, he is among the books you gave me. But I like Wardour Street English very much. The cast Wyndham proposes is splendid, and if you work hard, I shall have a great success. I am preparing a salon de lecture for you. S. M. Berneval sur Mer, July 26th. My dear Robbie, I wish you would not be so unkind about my pictures. I cannot go on storing them in London. It is childish. I want them here where I live. People were sweet enough to buy them in for me, and it would be ungracious and absurd to leave them in some warehouse or garret in England. They were given to me that I should have them. 
i have asked the frame maker here and he says that if paper is gummed or pasted over the glass it will be all right i do hope they will come this week mind you arrive by the day boat three thirty in the afternoon also do stay a long time i have a great deal of work for you to do le verre d'eau must be reconstructed entirely i hope dear moore is all right again i saw aubrey at dieppe on saturday he was looking very well and in good spirits i hope he is coming out here to-morrow to dine smithers the publisher was with him very intoxicated but amusing dear robbie i long for your arrival here yours oscar End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 4th of August, 1897. From the Catalogue of the Glynzer Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A remarkable series of letters giving the history of the Ballad of Reading Jail. Lot 159. Wild Oscar autograph letter signed to leonard smithers his publisher four pages quarto on heavy note paper with addressed envelope postmarked dieppe and inscribed strictly private signed in full bernavel sur mer august fourth ninety seven the wonderful parcel the prize packet in fact of books has just arrived and i must send you a line at once and tell you how nice it is of you to give them to me i hope very much that some day i shall have something that you will like well enough to publish to-night i will look at your wonderful productions by starlight the moon just at present is not to be relied on indeed she never is your generosity in not including simmons is much appreciated brilliant legible letter written shortly after his release from reading jail and before he had begun the ballad letters of this period are very rare and full dated ones still more so refers to ernest dowson end of section to robert ross twenty fourth of august from after reading this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Berneval sur mer, Tuesday, August 24th. My dearest Robbie, thanks for the cheque. I have sent it to the Dieppe Bank. My poem is still unfinished, but I have made up my mind to finish it this afternoon and send it to be typewritten. Once I see it, even typewritten, I shall be able to correct it now i am tired of the manuscript do you think this verse good i fear it is out of harmony but wish you were here to talk about it i miss you dreadfully dear boy the governor was strong upon the regulation act the doctor said that death was but a scientific fact and twice a day the chaplain called and left a little tract it is of course about the condemned man's life before his execution i have got in latrine it looks beautiful since blank wrote that he could not afford forty francs to come to rouen to see me he has never written nor have i i am greatly hurt by his meanness and his lack of imagination yours oscar End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 24th of August, 1897. From the Catalogue of the Glynzer Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wilde's First Allusion to the Ballad of Reading Jail. Lot 160. Wilde, Oscar. Autograph letter signed to Leonard Smithers. Three pages, quarto, on heavy note paper, with addressed envelope, unstamped. Signed in full berneval sur mer wednesday august twenty fourth eighteen ninety seven will you do me a great favour and have the poem i send you typewritten for me and bring it over with you on saturday 
or if you cannot come send it by post to sebastian melmoth care of hotel sandwich dieppe where i shall be i want it done on good paper not tissue paper and bound in a brown paper cover it is not yet finished but i want to see it typewritten i am sick of my manuscript very legible and neat the letter was evidently carried to england with the first draft of the ballad by someone of wilde's friends end of section to lord alfred douglas from some letters of oscar wilde to alfred douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain letter twenty five tuesday seven thirty my own darling boy i got your telegram half an hour ago and just send you a line to say that i feel that my only hope of again doing beautiful work in art is being with you it was not so in old days but now it is different and you can really recreate in me that energy and sense of joyous power on which art depends every one is furious with me for going back to you but they don't understand us i feel that it is only with you that i can do anything at all do remake my ruined life for me and then our friendship and love will have a different meaning to the world i wish that when we met at rouen we had not parted at all there are such wide abysses now of space and land between us but we love each other good night dear ever your oscar end of section to robert ross fourth of september from after reading this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Café Suisse, Dieppe, September 4th My dearest Robbie, the pictures arrived safely. I am delighted you have come back, as you will now be able to join me in Rouen, Hôtel d'Angleterre. I go in half an hour. I simply cannot stand Berneval. I nearly committed suicide there last Thursday. I was so bored. I have not yet finished my poem. I really want you. I have got in about the kiss of Caiaphas. It is very good. I am going at Rouen to try to rewrite my Love and Death, Florentine Tragedy. Do come to Rouen at once. Yours, Oscar. End of section. to robert ross twenty first of september eighteen ninety seven from the catalogue of the delau collection this librivox recording is in the public domain lot thirty five unpublished in the english edition four pages octavo from naples fifty pounds dated tuesday september twenty first eighteen ninety seven a letter of the first importance of which we can only quote a part explaining the course of action on which ross had strongly reprimanded him and excusing himself for acting against all advice setting aside the interior life of the soul with its passion for self-realization at all costs the world forced it on me i could have lived all my life with you but you have other claims on you claims you are too sweet a fellow to disregard Blank gave me three days and roland a sextet of sons but for the last month at berneval i was so lonely that i was on the brink of killing myself the world shuts its gateway against me i after three months struggle against a hideous philistine world turned naturally of course i shall often be unhappy hope to get a little villa or apartment somewhere and i hope to do work i think i shall be able to do so so do let people know that it was my only hope of life or literary activity lot thirty six unpublished in the english edition postcard from naples signed s m three pounds three shillings 
a lovely day going to naples i am quite happy hope you got my letter of yesterday and that you will tell people what i asked you to tell them please write soon and tell me all the news end of section to robert ross twenty fifth of september eighteen ninety seven from after Berneval. this librivox recording is in the public domain naples saturday september twenty fifth eighteen ninety seven dear robbie an italian here age twenty five a writer is anxious to translate salome i have no copy will you lend me yours it would be very good of you and i would return it honourably i hope to have salome played here in the winter s m end of section to robert ross twenty fourth of september eighteen ninety seven from after Berneval. this librivox recording is in the public domain villa giudice posilippo naples friday september twenty fourth eighteen ninety seven dearest robbie i have not answered your letters because they distressed me and angered me and i did not wish to write to you of all people in the world in an angry mood you have been such a good friend to me your love your generosity your care of me in prison and out of prison are the most lovely things in my life without you what would i have done as you made my life for me you have a perfect right to say what you choose to me but i have no right to say anything to you except to tell you how grateful i am to you and what a pleasure it is to feel gratitude and love at the same time for the same person the neapolitan papers are tedious and wish to interview me they write nicely of me but i don't want to be written about i want peace that is all perhaps i shall find it now to literature of course i want you to help me i have sent smithers my poem with directions for a typewritten copy to be sent at once to you please send me any suggestions and criticisms that occur to you also see smithers and pinker pinker lives at effingham house i must have three hundred pounds at least more if possible the poem is to be published simultaneously in the new york journal and by smithers i think bits of the poem very good now but i will never again out kipling henley blank has written three lovely sonnets which i have called the triad of the moon they are quite wonderful he has sent them to henley i have also got him to send his sonnet on mozart to the musician tomorrow i begin the florentine tragedy after that i must tackle pharaoh we have a lovely villa over the sea and a nice piano i take lessons in italian conversation from rocco three times a week my handwriting is now dreadful as bad as yours ever yours oscar end of section to leonard smithers second of october eighteen ninety seven from the bibliography of oscar wilde by stuart mason this librivox recording is in the public domain footnote this letter dated october second eighteen ninety seven is quoted in the story of the ballad of reading jail by richard butler glanzer in the bookman new york june nineteen eleven page three hundred and eighty in the glanzer sale catalogue new york november twenty eighth nineteen eleven lot one hundred and sixty one the date is given as october ninth End footnote. i have heard nothing from cook yet but i have no doubt that you have done what i asked you i am not asking you for an ordinary loan of money at all i am asking for a small advance on my poem which you are about to publish when you asked me my terms at dieppe i said i would be ready to leave the entire question to you you said you would give me the entire profits this offer i may say was made before not after dinner 
at the Café des Tribunaux. I said I would not agree to it, as I did not think it fair, but that I would take half the profits. This was agreed to. At that time I proposed to publish first in some paper, but since then I decided not to. Previous publicity would, of course, have damaged your sale. People will not pay half a crown for what they can buy for a penny. Why, I cannot understand. But it is so everywhere, except, perhaps, at Naples. So, after having let you have the virginity of the poem, I don't think I am really asking a great favour in saying that I wish you to advance me twenty pounds on account. In case you have not yet grasped the idea that an advance of twenty pounds on my poem is really a thing that I have a perfect right to expect on business grounds, pray do so at once. Application to you for a personal loan may, and, I have no doubt will, follow later on, but up to the present time our relations have been merely the usual ones of poet and publisher, with the usual complete victory for the latter. I also, such is the generosity of my nature, send enclosed four more verses of great power and romantic realistic suggestion, twenty-four lines in all. Footnote. The lines beginning with the last stanza are on page seven. The oak and elm have pleasant leaves, and ending with the third stanza on page eight. For none can tell to what red hell his sightless soul may stray. End footnote. Each worth a guinea in any of the market places for poetry. Will you kindly insert them in part two of the poem, after the sixth stanza, the one ending, had such a sin to pay. They come in there splendidly, and improve part two, as it was a little too short compared to the others. Also, I hope you have already written to me on the question of having an illustrated second edition of the poem. End of section. To Robert Ross 3rd of October, 1897, from After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villa Giudice, Posilippo, Naples, Sunday, October 3rd, 1897. My dear Robbie, I hope you have received a typewritten copy of the poem by this. I have just sent Smithers four more stanzas for insertion, one of them very good, in the romantic vein that you don't quite approve of, but on the whole it will, I think, make a balance in the poem. I can't be always banging the tins. Here it is. It is sweet to dance to violins when life and love are fair. To dance to flutes, to dance to lutes, is delicate and rare. But it is not sweet with nimble feet to dance upon the air. On the whole, I like the poem now, except the second and third stanzas of part three. I can't get that part right. I'm awaiting a thunderbolt from my solicitor. On the whole, dear Robbie, things are dark with storm. Unless Pinker gets me three hundred pounds, I shall not be able to get food. Up to the present, I have paid for almost everything. Do stir Pinker to acts of daring. Tell him that five hundred pounds is the proper price. Smithers is displaying levity in his business relations with me. It is very annoying. It is very curious that none of the English colony has left cards. Fortunately, I have a few simple friends amongst the poorer classes. When do you go to America? I expect a long letter from you about my poem— Pray go through it carefully, and note what you don't like. Ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, from After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villa Giudice, Thursday. My dear Robbie, thank you so much for your telegram. I am delighted to think you were to see Pinker. I really think that five hundred pounds should be asked, and three hundred pounds taken. 
and will send you a wire tomorrow to that effect. It is a coup that may come off. If it does, of course, I shall be all right for the winter. The winters here are so hot that I look forward with apprehension to them, as I have nothing but very thick clothes and cannot afford a new outfit. Smithers has been behaving very badly and now talks of an addition of six hundred copies at two shillings six pence. If the thing goes at all, it should certainly sell fifteen hundred copies at that price. If, on the other hand, five hundred is the probable sale, it should be five shillings. Smithers knows all about bad wine and bad women, but on books he is sadly to seek. Let me know by wire all progress. Yours, Oscar. End of section. To Robert Ross, 8th of October, 1897, from After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villa Giudice, Posilippo, Friday, October 8th, 1897. My dear Robbie, thanks so much for your letter. Smithers took my letter a little too seriously. It was unfair of him, as I certainly did not take his advice seriously though he gave me a great deal of it, through the medium of his typewriter. He is a very good fellow and most kind to me. With much of your criticism I agree. The poem suffers under the difficulty of a divided aim in style. Some is realistic, some is romantic, some poetry, some propaganda. I feel it keenly, but, as a whole, I think the production interesting. That it is interesting from more than one point of view is artistically to be regretted. With regard to the adjectives, I admit there are far too many dreadfuls and fearfuls. The difficulty is that the objects in prison have no shape or form. To take an example, the shed in which people are hanged is a little shed with a glass roof, like a photographer's studio on the sands at Margate. For eighteen months I thought it was the studio for photographing prisoners. There is no adjective to describe it. I call it hideous because it became so to me after I knew its use. In itself it is a wooden, oblong, narrow shed with a glass roof. A cell may be described psychologically with reference to its effect on the soul. In itself it can only be described as whitewashed or dimly lit. It has no shape, no contents. It does not exist from the point of view of form or colour. In point of fact, describing a prison is as difficult artistically as describing a water closet would be. If one had to describe the latter in literature, prose or verse, one could say merely that it was well or badly papered, or clean or the reverse. The horror of prison is that everything is so simple and commonplace in itself, and so degrading and hideous and revolting in its effect. The musician expressed a great desire to publish the poem. I refused. Now I think I would accept any English paper. If the musician would offer fifty pounds it would be a great thing, but of course I would prefer the Sunday Sun or Reynolds. If the Saturday will take it, well and good. I can't offer it myself, but Smithers could. It is very annoying that I cannot get a copy of the poem. I sent it exactly two weeks ago, and until I get it, I cannot pull it together. I write daily on the subject to Smithers. He takes no notice. I am not reproaching him for this. I am merely stating a fact. I am going to retain the opening of Part 4, but to cut out three stanzas at the opening of part three. As regards the spirits, I think that the grotesqueness of the scene, to a certain degree, makes their speech possible. But, blank, agrees with you, though we do not hold your views on the ghost in Hamlet. There is so little parallel between lyrical and dramatic poetry or method. I have had no money at all for three weeks, so cannot buy note-paper. This is your foolscap. Ever yours, Oscar. End of section.
to Robert Sherard, from Oscar Wilde, The Story of an Unhappy Friendship, by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A lying account of my words was immediately transmitted to Naples, and some days later I received from my friend a letter which distressed me greatly, for it showed me in what an unhappy state of mind he was. "'When you wish to talk morality, always an amusement,' he wrote, "'and to attack me behind my back, don't, like a good fellow, talk so loud, as the reverberation reaches from the blank club to naples also it is easy far too easy for you to find an audience that does not contain any friends of mine before them play tartuffe in the style of termagant to your heart's content but when you do it in the presence of friends of mine you expose yourself to rebuke and contempt and of course i hear all about it there were four pages in this style which was so strange coming from oscar wilde to me that i presumed things must be going very badly with him at the villa g blank and though i wrote him an exact account of what i had said and insisted on the fact that nobody was present when i had spoken he did not withdraw what was unkind and unjust in a letter of which i have not printed the most aggressive passages End of section. To Robert Ross, 19th of October, 1897, from After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hotel Royal de Etrangers, Naples, Tuesday, October 19th, 1897. My dear Robbie, thank you so much for all the trouble you have taken. I now think that as an addition of five hundred at two shillings, one hundred for reviews, authors, etc., would fetch only forty pounds, which would only just cover expenses of paper, printing, etc., with ten pounds for advertisements, and leave nothing at all for me. I had better publish in an English newspaper. I suggest Reynolds. It circulates largely amongst the lower orders and the criminal classes, and so ensures me my right audience for sympathy." Also, it has always been nice to me and about me. Pinker might approach them. I still think they would give a hundred pounds, and that if the New York Journal bites at the bait, my metaphor is drawn from fishing, it should give two hundred and fifty or three hundred pounds. But I may be disappointed. You are quite right in saying that the poem should end at Outcasts Always Mourn, but the propaganda which I desire to make begins there. I think I shall call the whole thing Poesie et Propagande, or Dichtung und Wahrheit. I have added two stanzas since I wrote, one I like. For man's grim justice goes its road, and may not swerve aside. It slays the weak, it slays the strong, it has a deadly stride. With iron heel it slays the strong, this monstrous parricide. Blank, is it Capri? I came back yesterday as there was Sirocco and rain. He dines with Mrs. Snow. We both lunched with Dr. Munter, who has a lovely villa and is a great connoisseur of Greek things. He is a wonderful personality. I hope you will not go to Canada. What am I to do without you in London? Ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 19th of October, 1897, from the Catalogue of the Gynzer Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 162. Wild, Oscar. Autograph letter signed to Leonard Smithers. Four pages, quarto, on the stationery of the Hotel Royal de Etranger, postmarked envelope with view of hotel, signed in full. Naples, Tuesday, October nineteenth, eighteen ninety seven. As an addition of five hundred, of which one hundred will go to the press, authors, etc., practically, will only just pay expenses, 
and leave me twenty pounds in your debt i now think it would be better after all to publish the poem in a paper it is too long for the chronicle frank harris has been so offensive to me and about me that i do not think negotiations possible with him my idea is reynolds it circulates widely among the criminal classes to which i now belong so i shall be read by my peers a new experience for me i have had a letter from ernest dowson to say he gave you ten pounds of his debt to me this seems improbable but i have no doubt he means well interesting letter his opinion of mr harris changed to him an ideal husband was dedicated and a scenario furnished for mr and mrs daventry end of section to a friend from the bibliography of oscar wilde by stuart mason this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As soon as I get rid of the ballad, I am going to begin my comedy, but at present the ballad still dominates. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 22nd of October, 1897. From The Real Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the desert of my life you raised up the lovely mirage of the great sum of twenty pounds. You said that its conversion into a reality was a matter of days. On the faith of this I took a lovely villa on the Bay of Naples, which I cannot inhabit as I have to take all my meals at the hotel. This is the simple truth after writing the above he adds much lower down your letter received to-day is dated monday last and dowson wrote to me that he had given you ten pounds for me on saturday what does this mean will you write to him and ask an explanation it seems a disgraceful thing of him to have said i will write to him about it myself End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 27th of October, 1897. From The Real Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your letter with Ernest's ten pounds and the manuscript were delivered on Monday last. The post is disgraceful here. It was very kind of you to secure the ten pounds for me, and I am much obliged it has amongst other things enabled me to buy some writing paper of the cheaper kind next week i hope to be able to buy a pen end of section to robert ross from after berneval this librivox recording is in the public domain villa giudice posilippo thursday dear robbie i have sent smithers the corrected copy i don't think i can do much more with the poem all your suggestions are very interesting but of course i have not taken them all black doc's dreadful pen for instance is my own impression of the place in which i stood it is burned into my memory as regards page thirteen goes forever through the land with the red feet of cain i have altered that not on account of hood but because i use cain later on and he is too big to be used twice with effect but do you think that in the corrected version i should have for the last line and binds it with a chain otherwise it is too like the end of the sphinx i fear i have built air castles of false gold on my dreams of america my hope now is in miss marbury who is on the spot but i should like murphy if he has authority to see the poem he represents the greatest paper in america you will consider this point yours oscar end of section to robert ross 30th of October, 
to the 16th of November, 1897, from After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villa Giudice, Posilippo, Saturday, October 30th, 1897. My dear Robbie, I hear from Smithers that you are in Durham, and that from that point of vantage you have expressed your disapproval of my proposal to publish in an English newspaper of any kind. I quite see that it would spoil the book, and, as you know, always intended to publish directly with the good Smithers, but he wrote several times to me to say he did not a bit mind the thing appearing elsewhere, and the desire of money and of a wide audience made me reconsider my decision. But now I feel it may be better to leave it entirely with Smithers. Reggie suggests syndicating the poem. This, of course, Pinker should have done. I now rely on Miss Marbley, with whom the poem will be quite safe. Will you kindly tell Smithers that I have written to Lewis Waller to ask him to send Smithers a copy of The Ideal Husband? Ever yours, Oscar. Villa Giudice, Posilippo, Monday, November 15th, 1897. My dear Robbie, the nine pounds which you so kindly announce is a miracle of a very wonderful kind. I am telegraphing to you for it. It is really most sweet and generous of you to have set it aside for me. I see that the difficulties about America are terrible. It is a sort of dreadful shock to me to find that there is such a barrier between me and the public. I must reconsider my position, as I cannot go on living here as I am doing, though I know there is no such thing as changing one's life. One merely wanders round and round within the circle of one's own personality. I am very pleased at what you say of the poem now. The reason I altered Red Hell into Hidden Hell was that it seemed violent, but I now wish to go back to it. Will you alter it in the copy for me? On page 8, line 4, I have written Arid Vigil, but I do not like it, because the vigil was rich in psychological experiences. I see nothing now but ceaseless, or endless, the latter for choice. Today the musician is to make me an offer. Unless it is a good one, I shall not take it. But I have almost given up hope about America, and must make money somehow. Of course, the musician must wait for simultaneous publication, if there is to be one. I am still a little loath to lose the opening of Canto Three, but I suppose it must go. I hear from Reggie of your wit combats with C. Blank. Please let me know about him. I love details about asses. More has appealed to me in the name of beauty and art to surrender my three pounds a week, but I don't think I dare to. What should I live on? Besides, I understood that it was a regular agreement, not a favour. That was the point on which you and Moore insisted to me always. I need not tell you that Blank could not give me three shillings a week. He has not enough for his own wants. So I don't think I should play Quixote. To tilt with death is worse than to tilt with windmills. Ever yours, Oscar. Villa Giudice, Posilippo, Naples, Tuesday, November 16th, 1897. My dear Robbie, I received this afternoon a letter from H. Blank, to say he was going to decide that I was to be deprived of my absurd income. I don't suppose that anything will prevent him from doing this, but I felt it due to myself to write to him a letter of protest nor do I think that it is fair to say that I have created a public scandal. My existence is a scandal, but I do not think that I should be charged with creating a scandal by continuing to live, though I am conscious that I do so. This is the point I have made to H. Blank. I merely tell it to you not that you should worry about a prejudged matter, but because I tell you everything. You tried your best to create a possible life for me, but it was one my own temperament could not suffer. 
you know what beautiful wise sensible schemes of life people bring to one there is nothing to be said against them except that they are not for one's self but don't think i am complaining i wish merely to tell you what has occurred i suppose you knew it already i myself felt it was coming you have not written to me for ages except about the worrying business of my unsaleable poem you had i know great worry about it i had no idea there were such barriers between me and publication in america i thought it would romp in and secure me a good lump sum it is curious how vanity helps the successful man and wrecks the failure in old days half of my strength was my vanity please let me know what books are being published and what is going on i sometimes see english papers but not often they are so dear i read all about carton's play an absurd production i wish you could come out here for a little i suppose it is impossible but of course we are terribly isolated i dare say paris would have been better but blank said he could not winter there i have written to ernest leverson for some of my money i don't know if anything will come of it of course do not say anything to him about it george ives has sent me his poems of course without an inscription his caution is amusing he means well which is the worst of it give my love to reggie ever yours dear robbie oscar end of section to a de leverson sixteenth of november eighteen ninety seven from the catalogue of the stetson collection this librivox recording is in the public domain lot three hundred and thirty five Autograph letter signed, 8 pages, Octavo, Naples, November 16th, 1897, to Mrs. Leverson. Signed, Oscar. My dear Ada, I have never answered your many sweet and brilliant letters, because I have been so hurt and wounded at Ernest's conduct to me in retaining money entrusted to him for my use. I was absolutely penniless and in want, I find that I cannot get my poem, a long poem of seven hundred lines, accepted even by the most revolting New York papers. So I am face to face with starvation, not in any theatrical sense, but as an ugly fact, etc. End of section. To Ada Leverson, version two from some letters of oscar wilde to alfred douglas this librivox recording is in the public domain my dear ada but now as the absurd income i had three pounds a week has been stopped by my trustees because i am here with bosie the only friend i have who is able or willing to be with me i am forced to do so and i find that i cannot get my poem a long poem of seven hundred lines accepted even by the most revolting new york papers so i am face to face with starvation not in any theatrical sense but as an ugly fact of course bosie as you know has only twenty-five pounds a month and naturally it is not enough for his own wants he cannot financially help me with either the smallest sum or the most meagre assistance he simply has not got the money. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 16th of November, 1897. Version 1. From The Real Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I cannot believe that he ever seriously contemplated suicide, though he frequently warns smithers that he has it in view i have before me a very curious letter of his to the publisher which is i think worth reproducing in extenso because apart from the threat it contains it throws light on his position at the time it is dated from the villa giudice sixteenth november eighteen ninety seven 
and runs my dear smithers do remember that what is comedy to you may be the reverse of comic to others since i received your letter in which you said i expect that before the arrival of this letter you will have received the ten pounds i have been down twice a day to naples to cook's office and i have just returned from third visit now five thirty of course there was nothing and i am really ashamed of my endless inquiries about a sum of ten pounds to be telegraphed from london perhaps you only wrote what you did to give me hope but my dear fellow hope constantly disappointed makes one's bread bitter especially as i have just heard from my own solicitor to say that as i am in naples with blank he is going to give his decision that i am leading an infamous life and so deprive me of my sole income thirty-eight pounds a quarter for one's own solicitor this seems a little strong unluckily he has it in his power to stop my wretched allowance and is going to do so and as i see my poem is a very unsaleable affair the ballad of reading jail i simply have starvation or suicide before me the latter as i dislike pain for choice he concludes this letter in which he expresses the thought that there is just a chance of a big sale for the ballad with the words the weather is entrancing but in my heart there is no sun end of section to leonard smithers sixteenth of november eighteen ninety seven version two from the bibliography of oscar wilde by stuart mason this librivox recording is in the public domain on november sixteenth wilde who was still at naples wrote to smithers i am anxious however to correct my proofs before retiring from this world of injustice worry and annoyance so do let me have them you said you would send them last wednesday as yet no sign of them i should not like to die without seeing my poem as good as i can make a poem whose subject is all wrong and whose treatment too personal i hope to receive the proofs this week as regards the cover do what you like the simpler the better i won't write any more about america i have no hopes but i do trust you will copyright it in the states there is a chance just a chance of a big sale end of section to leonard smithers from the catalogue of the stetson collection this librivox recording is in the public domain autograph letter signed from oscar wilde to leonard smithers eight pages folio naples with addressed envelope now i can really think about my position and form some judgment as to whether it is worth fighting on against the hideous forces of the world personally i don't think it is but vanity still drives me to think of a possible future of self-assertion the proofs have just arrived in old days of power and personality i always insisted that my proofs should be sent to me on the paper to be ultimately used i had intended that wherever there was a break in my poem a new page should begin failing this it really would be better to print on alternate leaves as you suggested then follow long and interesting comments on the make-up of the book with changes in the page of dedication etc end of section to robert ross nineteenth of november eighteen ninety seven from after berneval this librivox recording is in the public domain villa giudici posilippo naples friday november nineteenth eighteen ninety seven my dear robbie of course i received with gratitude and wonder the nine pounds i wrote to you some days ago to say so but our post is so bad that letters take four or five days i would have wired my thanks only i feared you would think it extravagant 
the only reason i mentioned your having read my letter the private parts of it to smithers was that he wrote to me a private letter in his own handwriting saying is it kind or just of you to say to ross that i dictated to my typewriter advice about blank i carefully suppressed the name of course my remarks to you were of the nature of enforced repartee but blank says that the words cruel and unfounded charge in your letter are a joke a seer of old standing so i dare say you were not serious but tragedy and comedy are so mixed in my life now that i lose the sense of difference the poem as printed looks like a sixpenny pamphlet i have written to smithers to say that if he wishes to ask three shillings six pence he should make it look as a book to be worth at least ninepence this can be done by different pagination grey hunger and green thirst might seem an echo of swinburne's green pleasure and grey grief by the way is there any difference between grey g r e y and grey g r a y i believe there is but i don't know what it is in one place in the poem smithers suggests g r a y in others he leaves g r e y perhaps he is seeing red i believe they are sympathetic colours in spectroscope investigations the point of the doctor is childish the description is generic it is a type the account of the execution is not the account of the reading scene it is general i am going to put in some coarse-faced doctor pray assure smithers that this is adequate it is adequate i don't like using another's vigil because i end the verse by the words another's teller and taking that as my cue begin a new stanza by another's guilt three times is too much but i won't have arid i now put endless ever yours oscar end of section to robert ross december eighteen ninety seven from after berneval this librivox recording is in the public domain villa giudici posilippo naples december eighteen ninety seven my dear robbie i have not heard yet from hansel or adrian hope nor do i know whether they will answer or not how i spend my money is surely a question for myself besides the income was purchased and sold for a consideration you often said to me in your letters you have now as a right what before you had only as a favour i am not reproaching you but pointing out that it turns out that after all i have it at the whim of blank with regard to leverson his statement is quite untrue on my way to the court the last day to be sentenced he asked me whether he might take his two hundred and fifty pounds out of the trust money i said that i could not possibly assent to that as the money was not given me to pay my debts and i did not know what my mother's wants would be that she was the person to be considered first i think his conduct utterly dreadful and dishonourable and his taking no notice of my letters unpardonably insolent i am going to write to him again i suppose smithers has received the proofs by this time pray look them over carefully i may have omitted something or passed over an error the actor manager here cesare rossi was astounded with salome but said he had no actress who could possibly touch the part i am going to try deuce but have not much hope my books have come from dieppe by long sea but i have not the money to get them out so i have to do without them for the present it is a great nuisance the gil blas has an interview with me which i send you ever yours oscar 
End of section. To Robert Ross, 25th of November, 1897, from After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villa Giudice, Posilippo, Thursday, November 25th, 1897. My dear Robbie, thanks for writing to me. The situation is appalling. I will begin by a few literary notes. I have put back the stanzas I expunged, because I think they are dramatically necessary for the narrative. I think people will want to know what the man did after his conviction, so the narrative is improved, though the poetry is not good. But while it is possible to correct a good verse, it is almost impossible to correct a bad one. I have put, the governor was strict upon the regulations act. I now think that strong is better. The verse is meant to be colloquial, G. R. Sims at best, and when one is going for a coarse effect, one had better be coarse. So please restore strong. You did not like the man in red who reads the law, because you said it reminded you of the man in blue for a policeman. The reminiscence it brought to me was the voila l'homme rouge qui passait of hugo's marion de l'homme and i like the expression but who reads one's doom would i think be better will you alter this for me unless you think i have fiddled too often on the string of doom smithers has been very kind and sent me five pounds he promises another this week but it has not yet arrived I think after Christmas would be better for publication. I am hardly a Christmas present. What astonishes and interests me about my position is that the moment the world's forces begin to persecute anyone, they never leave off. This seems to me a historical fact, as well as an interesting psychological problem. To leave off persecution is to admit that one has been wrong, and the world will never do that. Also, the world is angry because its punishment has had no effect. People wanted to be able to say, We have done a capital thing for Oscar Wilde by putting him in prison. But now they find that they merely treated me barbarously, but did not influence me. They simply ruined me, so they are furious. I have written to Adrian Hope, but have not yet heard anything. To Hansel I have written violently. Of dear Moore I have made a holocaust. It had to be. But he will survive my pyre. In the ashes his heart, cor cordium, will be found untouched. I will write tomorrow, but for the future cannot afford stamps. Ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To Leonard Smithers. 23rd of November, 1897, version 1, from the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lot 350. Autograph letter signed, 8 pages, octavo, from Oscar Wilde to Leonard Smithers. Naples, Sunday, November 23rd, 1897, with addressed envelope. Do try and make the Chiswick Press less mad and less maddening. I now have, while some coarse-mouthed doctor straddles by with a flattened bulldog nose, fingering the watch, etc. If they kick, I cannot sacrifice the lines about the watch. I wish you would start a society for the defence of oppressed personality, at present there is a gross european concert headed by brutes and solicitors against us it is really ridiculous that after my entire life has been wrecked by society people should still propose to exercise social tyranny over me and try to force me to live in solitude etc end of section to leonard smithers Version 2. From the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Autograph letter signed, eight pages, octavo, from Oscar Wilde to Leonard Smithers, with envelope. Do try and make the Chiswick press less mad and less maddening. However, if they kick, I cannot sacrifice the lines about the watch, so I enclose a feeble substitute. But I shall be outraged, and perhaps outrageous, if it is used, etc. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, version 3, from Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I wish you would start a society for the defence of oppressed personalities. At present there is a gross European concert headed by brutes and solicitors against us. It is really ridiculous that after my entire life has been wrecked by society, people should still propose to exercise social tyranny over me, and try to force me to live in solitude, the one thing I can't stand. I lived in silence and solitude for two years in prison. I did not think that on my release, my wife, my trustees, the guardians of my children, my few friends, such as they are, and my myriad enemies, would combine to force me by starvation to live in silence and solitude again. The scheme is put forward on moral grounds. It is proposed to leave me to die of starvation, or to blow my brains out in a Naples urinal. I never came across anyone in whom the moral sense was dominant, who was not heartless, cruel, vindictive, log-stupid, and entirely lacking in the smallest sense of humanity. Moral people, as they are termed, are simple beasts. I would sooner have fifty unnatural vices than one unnatural virtue. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 30th of November, 1897. From the Catalogue of the Glynzer Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fine Tribute to Robert Ross Lot 163 Wild, Oscar Autograph letter signed to Leonard Smithers Four pages, octavo Signed in full Villa del Giudice, Posilippo, November 30th, 1897 Robbie Ross has sent me a copy of a letter he has written you, in which he states that he finds he has no longer my confidence in business matters, and so does not wish to be connected with my affairs. I assure you that Robbie writes under a complete misapprehension. Robbie has done everything for me in business that anyone on earth could do, and his own generosity and unwearying kindness are beyond any expression of praise on my part, though, I am glad to say, not beyond my powers of gratitude. It would be fairer of him to say that it is too much worry to go on, than that he finds he has not my confidence. Such a statement is childish. Fine and legible letter, but written in a state of nervous tension, marked by frequent abbreviations. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, version 1 from the Catalogue of the Stetson Collection. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Autograph letter signed, 12 pages, octavo, from Oscar Wilde to Leonard Smithers, Naples, no date, with addressed envelope. Your letter just received. I am glad you are going to print on one side only. As I have lost my entire income, I can't live with Alfred Douglas any more. You give me no news about the verse about the doctor. I think that with my alteration it would stand. My handwriting, once Greek and gracious, is now illegible. I am very sorry, but I really am a wreck of nerves. I don't eat or sleep. I live on cigarettes. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, February 1898,
Version 2 From Some Letters of Oscar Wilde to Alfred Douglas This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Writing from Naples in February 1898 to Leonard Smithers, he says, As I have lost my entire income, of course I cannot live with Alfred Douglas any more. He has only just enough for himself. So he is going back to Paris, and I will be alone here. I do not know if, now that we are going to separate, there is any likelihood of my income being restored to me. I, unluckily, have now no one to plead my cause aright. I have alienated all my friends, partly through my own fault, and partly through theirs. The Paris Journal has a sympathetic paragraph to say I am starving at Naples, but French people subscribe nothing but sonnets when one is alive, and statues when one is not. End of section. To Robert Ross, 6th of December, 1897. From After Berneval. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villa Giudice, Naples. Monday. December 6th, 1897. My dear Robbie, I know that it would have been impossible for you to have prevented H. Blank's decision. What hurt me was that no effort was made, and I still hold that more was wrong. H. Blank is of the same opinion. He writes to me that he gave his decision not on the grounds of the written agreement, but on the understanding that existed. He told me at Reading that he would decide so. At that time I didn't mind. Afterwards was a different thing. I then had a right to claim that the strictest legal interpretation should be put on the wording of a very elaborate agreement. I knew that I was running a fearful risk of losing my income. I was warned on all sides. My eyes were not blinded. Still, I was a good deal staggered by the blow, one may go to a dentist of one's own free will, but the moment of tooth extraction is painful, as Moore's acquiescence in Mr. Hargrove's refusal to pay Mr. Holman wounded me, and I shot poisoned arrows back. Arthur Clifton is trying to arrange terms with Adrian Hope. I hope he will do this, but Adrian Hope has never answered my letter to him. I have not much hope, however. Things have come to a crash of a terrible character. You have done wonderful things for me, but the nemesis of circumstances, the nemesis of character, has been too strong for me. And, as I said to Moore, I think I was a problem for which there was no solution. Money alone could not have helped me, not to solve, but to avoid solving the difficulty. As for your letter to Smithers, I don't think you should have taken up such an attitude about me in consequence of some phrase in a letter of someone else's, with which I have nothing to do. You wrote to Smithers, I hope you will refuse to publish Oscar Wilde's poem if he insists on publishing first in a paper. The question of Smithers publishing in book form something that had appeared in a periodical was a question for him. What you meant, of course, was that you hoped Smithers would induce me to consent not to publish in a periodical. In point of fact, Smithers wrote to me seven weeks ago that he did not care tuppence whether I published previously or not. He did this in answer to a letter of mine in which I told him that I had refused an offer from the musician, on the ground that it would spoil Smithers' book. Blank did not and does not see why, if I got twenty-five pounds or fifty pounds from a paper for the poem, you should try to induce Smithers to refuse to publish in book form. Such things are constantly done. In any case, it was a matter for Smithers to decide, and he had previously assured me that he did not care a scrap. This was the meaning of blank's no doubt too vivacious expression, and there is no offence in its substance. While, as for the form, I don't think that in the correspondence of either of you form has been the predominant note, or the sense of beauty, the indwelling spirit. 
In any case, it has nothing to do with me. I hope Smithers will show you all my letters to him in which you are mentioned. I am greatly and rightly pained at your writing to him that our intimate friendship is over, and that you find you have no longer my confidence in business matters. The former is a question, at any rate, for yourself. The latter is unjust, unwarranted, and unkind. And, on the whole, I do think you make wonderfully little allowance for a man like myself, now ruined, broken-hearted, and thoroughly unhappy. You stab me with a thousand phrases. If one phrase of mine shrills through the air near you, you cry out that you are wounded to death. Ever yours, Oscar. End of section. To Leonard Smithers from The Real Oscar Wilde by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three weeks later, he again writes to Smithers and again threatens suicide. I await the revise, he writes and promise not to make my quietus with a bare bodkin till I have returned them. After that I think of retiring. But first I would like to dine with you here. To leave life as one leaves a feast is not merely philosophy, but romance. If space allowed of it, one would like to quote the whole of this letter. It appears that Miss Marbury had proposed that the ballad should be illustrated, and Oscar writes... Her suggestion of illustrations is, of course, out of the question. Pray tell her from me that I feel that it would entirely spoil any beauty the poem has, and not add anything to its psychological revelations. The horror of prison life is the contrast between the grotesqueness of one's aspect and the tragedy of one's soul. Illustrations would emphasise the former and conceal the latter. Of course, I refer to realistic illustration. In the same letter, he humorously pays off an old score he seems to have had against Jerome K. Jerome. He writes, I have seen the Academy with its list of immortals. It is very funny what sort of people are proposed, but it is sufficient, no doubt, to make out a list. Personally, I cannot make up my mind as to whether the Duke of Argyle or Jerome K. Jerome has the better claims. I think the former. The unread is always better than the unreadable. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, from The Real Oscar Wilde, by Robert Sherard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and he certainly never showed that he suffered from his position, as was revealed in that letter which he wrote to Smithers from Naples some months later, where, after complaining that certain people to whom he had written had left his letter unanswered, he adds, The fact is that when a man has had two years' hard labour, people quite naturally treat him as a pariah dog. This is a social truth that I realise every day. I don't complain about it, there is no use complaining about facts. Je constate la fait, c'est tout. It comes from the decay of the imagination in the race, caused by the pressure of an artificial society, and, after all, when my own wife leaves me to die of starvation in Naples, without taking the smallest interest in the matter, I don't see why I should expect old friends to take the trouble to even answer or acknowledge my letters. But let us return to the poem. There's life in art, take refuge there, says Goethe, slightly misquoted. End of section. To Leonard Smithers, 9th of January, 1898. From the Bibliography of Oscar Wilde by Stuart Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Writing from 51 Santa Lucia, Naples, on January 9th, 1898, to Smithers, Wilde said, The revise has never arrived, and I have waited from day to day for it. To wait longer would be foolish. 
i am sure it is all right as regards your suggestion or request that i should revert to in god's sweet world again instead of for weal or woe again canto two somewhere certainly pray make the correction yourself second thoughts in art are always or often worst the c three three i enclose seems excellent the c t w of in memoriam page was slightly larger as before trooper same page should have a capital t i think that in the royal horse guards should read of the r h g i don't know however you might ask of seems nicer the cover etc i leave to you the post here is impossible so pray bring it all out as soon as possible without further consultation i as all poets am safe in your hands as regards america i think it would be better now to publish there without my name i see that it is my name that terrifies i hope an edition of some kind will appear i cannot advise what should be done but it seems to me that the withdrawal of my name is essential in america as elsewhere and the public like an open secret half of the success of marie corelli is due to the no doubt unfounded rumour that she is a woman in other respects pray do as you like about america but do see that there is some addition i have had misfortunes since i wrote to you influenza the robbery during my absence in sicily of all my clothes etc by a servant whom i left at the villa ill health loneliness and general ennui with a tragic comedy of an existence but i want to see my poem out before i take steps end of section end of letters of oscar wilde volume four eighteen ninety seven to eighteen ninety eight